Bound to Darkness Shadow Bound Series Book 1 By Sierra Graves Chapter 1 Beckett Rain pattered the windows in the kitchen as I looked out at the white-trimmed greenhouse. Flanking the greenhouse were two tall stoic red maples. That's what they always looked like to me, seeing them every day as I grew up. Not just trees, but guardians of my mother's sacred greenhouse. Her sanctuary, or hideout, whatever she decided to call it. It's where she spent the majority of her time, even when I was little. She'd take me in there with her to help grow herbs and cultivate the flowers for healing remedies. Back then she still had faith that I'd make something of myself. Now, I don't even have to turn around to know she's scowling at the back of my head with a disappointed frown. I stir the sugar into my coffee as slowly as I can, just to drag the moment out. Her annoyance fills the room, and I hide a smirk as I lift my mug and take a sip. Lately, driving her bonkers is the only enjoyment I get out of being her daughter. Not like she's proud of me. I can count the number of times I've heard her sing my praises to the witches in the Shadow Moon Coven. Count them on one damned hand because I'm pretty sure it's two, maybe three. I really wish you'd wear your hair differently, she commented as I turned around finally to face her. I stayed at the counter with the sink and the window to my back. Yeah? I'm sure you do. Harriet Jenkins was the pride and joy of the Shadow Moon Coven. She was what they believed every witch should strive to be. Her curly black hair, which I inherited, hung to her waist. She usually wore it loose, unless we were preparing for a festival or a celebration or the equinox. Then she decorated with flowers and herbs, braids and beads. I purposely sheared off a good foot and a half of my hair the first time she said I disappointed her. That was when I just turned 16 and had shown, as she called it, no extraordinary gifts. I'd grabbed a pair of scissors and gone to town. I still won't let it grow to my waist, to her dismay. I usually wear it up too, just to spite her. Hair clips and ponytail holders were my best friends. My mother hated them. She hated my black leather pants, which I chose over the flowing dresses and skirts that made up her entire wardrobe. She really hated my black leather knee-high boots and my leather jacket. And how my right ear was pierced from lobe to cartilage. The tattoos I had on my forearms were nothing like the markings any other witch in the coven had. They stuck with traditional symbols, designating their chosen path and their magical strengths. Since I had no magical strengths at all, I opted for something a bit different. I grinned at the large bear tattoo on my right arm and the spider on my left. The spider at least represented something witchy, not that it won me any points. I'd mess that up too summoning my familiar for the first time. But I sensed, today's conversation wasn't going to have anything to do with my screw-up from years ago. No, this had to do with something much more recent. You going to tell me why you summoned me here? I asked, to break the tension and get the conversation moving along. I do have a job to get to today at some point, and I'm never late. She pursed her lips. Her vibrant green eyes that were just like mine, told me this was not going to be a fun chat between mother and daughter. It never was. There is a serious matter I wish to discuss with you, hence the summoning. You could have texted me. You don't respond, and calling you doesn't work either since you send me straight to voicemail every time, she argued. Your own mother, I mean, really? What? I figure if it's that important, you have other means of contacting me, like how you dragged me out of my loft this morning. I'd barely woken up and said hello to my familiar, when I'd been struck with a terrible sensation to come and see my mother. I knew what she'd been up to, and I tried for the better part of an hour to ignore her summons. All that did was make the person being summoned sick. My head still hurt. I rubbed at my forehead, and she leaned back in the wooden kitchen chair, crossing her arms. Yeah, I got it. Apparently, it's important. It's always important. Everything we do is important. Can we skip the lecture today, please? I'm really not in the mood to hear it, and I've got it memorized already anyway. Her pursed lips told me, I just made the conversation that was to come much harder than it needed to be. 
You are nearing the peak age for a witch in her prime, she said as she stood and walked slowly toward me. Most witches, when they near the age of twenty-five, have excelled in a specific type of magic. Or they've even invented a few of their own spells and potions. I shifted on my feet, and did my best to keep my glaring to a minimum. I found what makes me happy. Your abundance of plant life does little to aid your spells. I grow a vast array of ingredients for other witches, I argued. And last I checked, I'm the only one who has successfully bred and grown numerous new species that are in high demand amongst the covens. Not many people have the green thumb I do, and that's all natural. No magic needed. I don't see what the trouble is. Most of the coven comes to me when they need ingredients they can't get at the shops. Hell, I supply quite a few of the shops myself. Beckett, it's not your hobby that worries me. It's the magic that exists inside you. My brow crinkled at her choice of words. I was one of the best herbologists on the West Coast. Why couldn't she ever take two seconds to tell me how amazing that achievement was? Worries you? Why would it worry you? It's just there and that's not normal. Then you think what? Someday I'm just going to go all psycho, turn into a crazy witch and try to kill everyone? I'm fine. Everything about me and my magic is fine. We've seen it before, she said as I turned my back to her. Witches who were unable to master their power. Eventually, it finds a way to come out. Power is driven by emotions, Beckett. You know this. It's the first lesson every witch is taught. Yeah, and the only person driving me to have extreme emotions right now is you. Stop being so damn melodramatic. I whipped around. The air in the kitchen dropped ten degrees. Her brow arched as if it was my fault. I told myself to get a grip while I grabbed at the counter behind me, forcing myself not to fall for it. She's trying to get me to lose control to prove a point. I won't let that happen. I've only ever had two outbursts, I reminded her once the temperature returned to normal. Two and I was young. It's not my fault my magic doesn't want to come out or be used. Maybe it's shy. You come from a long line of powerful witches. She walked toward me and gently lifted the lock of white hair. It was a reminder of how messed up my magic was. This incident could have been so much worse. You could have scarred yourself for life instead of merely turning some of your hair white. You could have hurt someone else. I backed away. What are you trying to tell me? Just spit it out already. She sighed, and a pained look came across her face that did nothing to match the disappointment in her eyes. The elders and I have decided it's time to bind your powers for good. It's time for you to accept who you are, or rather what you're not. I stuck a finger in my ear and wiggled it. I'm sorry, what did you just say? Don't make this any harder than it already is. Harder for who? You or me? The kitchen seemed extremely small of a sudden, and it was hard to breathe. Bind my powers. You want me to live as a mortal? Don't you already? No, I don't. I have familiars and magic. I do use magic. Small spells. I doubt you even know you're doing it half the time, and when you do try to do anything bigger, it always backfires. Not always, I muttered. She grabbed hold of my upper arms and squeezed. Always. I, for one, am tired of cleaning up your messes, and it's only a matter of time before you go too far. I wrenched away from her grip and stormed around the kitchen. And your solution is not to try and teach me anymore, but to just make me suffer for the rest of my life? I'm a witch. You're a witch and so is my father. You can't just take away who I am. I won't them do it. I won't let you do it, I added, pointing an accusing finger at her. You don't have a choice. It's been decided. Without my input. I snapped. You can't do this. Actually, we can. When the entire Council of Elders is in agreement about the danger, a specific witch poses to the rest of us. For the goddess Sake Beckett, you've nearly exposed magic more times than I can count. This is all your fault, I muttered through gritted teeth. All of it. Yes. 
and how is that? You gave up on me, I yelled, and my words bounced around the high ceiling of the kitchen. You all did. You saw that I wasn't some, some damned prodigy and you just left me to fend for myself. You were given ample opportunity to prove yourself. She sighed heavily and resumed her seat at the kitchen table like we weren't talking about my future as a witch. You're not the only one this decision is hurting. You have no idea what this is doing to me. Yeah, I can see you're really torn up about it. I am. I'm your mother, and I love you. I want to see you succeed. I lifted my hand to cut off what was probably a well-rehearsed speech that was all bullshit. Just stop lying to me. You're happy, you'll get to be rid of the greatest embarrassment of your life. Just admit it and save us both some time. She picked up her coffee mug and shrugged. Fine, I admit it. I pushed my tongue against my cheek and nodded. Well, I guess there's nothing else to say on the matter then. I moved to the back door. She called my name. What? Haven't you said enough? The elders will be convening in three weeks when the moon is full on the second night. I suggest you not be late and listen to their verdict without putting up a fight. Yeah, because fighting for me to keep my heritage should have been your job. I threw the back door open hard enough to crash it into the kitchen wall and leave a dent. She called after me, but I didn't stop this time. I marched through her garden beds, which were still full of blooming flowers and vegetables thanks to her magic. This damned garden never froze over or had a single plant die. As I reached the wrought iron gate that led to the front walk, I glared at the yard over my shoulder. I considered attempting a curse on the vibrant orange and red blooms. Just as I was about to raise my hand and imagine those petals turning brown and falling dead to the ground, I hesitated. I mentally willed them all to die instead, then exited the yard. My old black Chevy truck was parked at the end of the winding gravel drive that led to my parents' house. They lived as far out of the city as they could. It gave my mother a chance to use her magic to its full extent and stay hidden from mortals. I floored it down the drive, sending rocks spraying in all directions. As I headed toward the blacktop and then the highway that would take me back to Seattle, I tried not to remember that look in my mother's eyes. The disappointment I was used to seeing, but the glee at having my powers permanently bound, I had to be imagining that. By the time I got back to my loft overlooking the water, I was in no mood to go to work, but I never missed a day unless I was deathly ill. I had an hour to kill, before I had to leave, and hurried upstairs to finish taking care of my plants for the day. Frankie, I'm back, I called as I entered my loft and kicked the door shut behind me. From the sound of that door slam, I'd say it went great, a voice replied from within the depths of the forest that grew inside my living room and stretched up to the balcony. By the blue hearts. I dropped my keys and cell phone on the small table by the door, and ducked under the low-hanging vines, checking the latest blooms as I did. Yeah no it was great. Awesome really. You know every visit I have with my mother is just fantastic. Wow we're at like a 10 on the sarcasm level today, Frankie said, and I heard the laughter in his words. Care to share, or do you just want to wallow in self-pity all day about your mother driving you crazy? I searched for my small set of clippers as I shrugged. It's a bit worse today. What did she do? I snipped a few of the small blossoms that weren't going to bloom all the way. They fell to the floor at my feet, and I bit back a sudden urge to cry at how unfair my life just became. A familiar dark shape shifted into view and lifted a hand in question. My shadow was always doing its best to cheer me up, but I didn't think its usual antics would work today. Apparently, the elders, including Harriet Jenkins, have decided it would be best for everyone if they bound my magic. Forever. What? Frankie snapped, his voice coming from overhead now. They can't do that. Oh, but they can. I have three weeks. No, absolutely not, he argued, and this time he was right above me. I tilted my head back and studied the large, blue-green shell that protected most of Frankie's slimy body. His body, about the size of my fists put together, clung to the vines above me. He wasn't the typical familiar but he was what my magic created. 
He was really the only one I could talk to about everything, and was always wise. Well, most of the time, Frankie had two sides. The wise, polite, and kind side, and then the angry, going to do everything to protect me side. I clipped another blossom, then checked over a few leaves that were turning brown. I don't think there's anything I can do to change their minds. But you're a witch. It's your right to have magic. It's not like you've hurt anyone. I touch my hair. Yet. I haven't hurt anyone. Yet. Or exposed my magic to mortals. Yet. They seem to be under the impression I'm a ticking time bomb, and any second my magic is going to go full-blown evil witch mode. I set the clippers down and lifted my hand for Frankie to slide into. I don't know what to think right now. He turned himself around so he faced me, and stretched his neck as high as he could, staring at me intently with those two antenna eyes of his. You are not going to stand there and give up. I won't allow it. Don't make me go all furry and angry today. I smiled and set him on the work table that sat against the floor-to-ceiling windows, which provided a view of the shimmering blue water. I guess I could do something to make them reconsider. Show them I can use magic properly. Do you not see your loft? he asked as my shadow nodded eagerly from the floor. Or your shadow? How many witches can pull that spell off? Not many, but we all know how long that took. Eh, so you're a late bloomer. Who cares? Harriet Jenkins does. Snails aren't very good with facial expressions, but I sensed a very intense sassy look coming from Frankie. Your mother has a big head. I smirked. She's a damn good witch. Not that good, he muttered. Just promise me you're not just going to roll over and give up? I flipped through the book of plants, herbs and fungi. It started as a pretty thin book that I'd added to over the years as my expertise of herbology grew. My mother might think I haven't done anything worthwhile, but I'd been creating cross-species of various flowers and herbs for the past five years. Most of them now exhibited incredible properties for healing, or to help give a power boost to various spells. By mortal standards, I'd be a genius. By my mother's standards, it wasn't worth letting me keep my magic. I went about my usual routine of checking each plant in my loft. Frankie did his best to keep my spirits high, as did my shadow. They helped me water and trim the plants that needed it, mark those that needed to be repotted, and label other ones that were ready to be harvested and broken down into their various parts. Going through the motions relaxed me enough that when the alarm on my cell went off at one in the afternoon, reminding me to get ready for work, I wasn't as ticked off as I had been when I'd gotten home. I tossed my cell and my wallet in my black satchel, scooped up the small bunch of yellow lemon blooms that were ready, and headed out the door with my shadow trailing along behind me. Frankie would hold down the fort as he always did. He was a good friend. My only friend, really. Way to go, Beckett, I muttered as I pulled out into traffic and drove toward the bookstore I worked at. Just bring yourself down even more. Most of the witches my age hung out together or found their special someone or were at least trying to date. But I wasn't someone other witches wanted to be seen with. I was the failure, the outcast, the bad luck witch. Just because the majority of the spells I cast didn't go as planned, didn't mean I was cursed, though over the years the thought had crossed my mind. I pulled around to the back of the two-story brick building of a not-so-busy street, next to a cafe, record store and a Chinese restaurant across the way. A few doors down was an herbalist shop for witches. The woman who ran it was one of my best clients. I wondered if she'd vouch for me with the elders, though not many people had the nerve to stand up to my mother. I parked the truck in my usual spot beneath the light pole, since I closed up the shop after it was dark, and walked in through the back door. Hey Rose, I called out as the bell tinkled overhead. There you are. We just got a new shipment in today, she replied from the front, through the solid cherry wood bookcases that lined her store. Think you'll enjoy these. There are some old ones in here. I wove my way through the tall shelves and the short ones, until I made it to the center of the store where there was just enough space cleared to stack boxes for sort new books. Yeah? Glad to hear it. I needed something to brighten up my day. Oh and here, 
Put these in some sugar water when you go upstairs. They'll bloom first thing in the morning. Rose appeared from behind a tall stack of cardboard boxes with a bright smile on her face. She took the lemon blooms and breathed them in. These are gorgeous. They are. And don't forget what you're supposed to do with the petals after they bloom. She waved at me with a sigh. You worry about an old woman too much. She bustled to the front of the store, her long white hair trailing down to her waist. She wore clothes that were not typical for a 70-something-year-old woman. Her leather pants, black long sleeve shirt, and the numerous rings on her hands threw most off when they first walked into her store. She was fiery, and I'd learned more from her in the last five years working in her shop than I had from my own mother. I worry about your heart condition, I said as I followed her to the register. I've got a new batch of pygmy bark almost ready. That'll be something you can take once a month. And I have the raven swart ready to go. Just needs to be woven into a wreath to keep dark spirits away this fall. She glanced at me over the flowers in her hand. Don't you ever stop worrying about me. Or your plants. It's not like I have anything else to do, I mumbled and tucked my satchel under the front counter. Rose was one of the few mortals who knew I was a witch. She had been sworn to secrecy. Not really, but she saw me use a spell one day when I was frustrated. I'd been impatient with the books and cast a spell to sort them on their own. I ended up causing half of them to fly and the other half to do a tango across the floor. Kind of hard to lie when the evidence of my magic was literally all over the shop. She also knew how I really felt about my mother and was one of the few people who bothered to ask me what was wrong when I was upset. All right, Spill, she said when I turned to go to the stack of boxes. What's up with you? Nothing, I'm having an awesome Monday. Just awesome. You are a bad liar. You know I'm going to keep bugging you until you tell me. I'm a crotchety old woman who has nothing better to do than annoy you. She stood on the other side of the boxes, tapping her boot. Beckett. Fine, fine, stubborn woman. I let out a heavy breath and said, I had to see my mother this morning, and it was not a very pleasant conversation. Wait, let me make you some hot cider and you can tell me all about it. When Rose came back downstairs five minutes later, she had two steaming mugs in her hands. I took one and at the first sip I smiled. Cider and whiskey? Rose, I have to run your shop for the rest of the day. You'll be fine. Good for the soul. Now come on spill. What did that old hag do now? I started with the summoning bright and early this morning and told Rose about the conversation I had with my mother. The not-so-pleasant conversation about how she thought it best to bind my magic permanently, just in case. I ranted for the better part of an hour as I unpacked two boxes and sorted the volumes by genre or topic. I was sitting on the floor at that point, and when I finished, telling Rose that I'd considered placing a curse on my mother's backyard of pretty flowers, I let my face fall into my hands. I hate what she does to me, I mumbled then sat up. I'm a nice person, you know. I do awesome things. I have a great life, but because I'm not out there. I don't know. Doing something like kicking evil witch ass every day or finding breakthroughs in spells and potions, I'm not good enough. My life is no longer in my own hands. I mean it's not my fault my magic's wonky. Probably hers, right? Jeans and all that. Rose slowly set her mug down on a nearby shelf. You know, I don't think it is. Wait. What? What isn't? Rose? She'd hurried past me, to the ramp that led to the lower level of the bookstore. It wasn't really a basement, more like a den. It was where she stored books she either had come across and couldn't part with, or those that needed repairs. Her bookstore specialized in the old and strange, as well as restoring very old works. What are you talking about? I persisted. She was bent over, rummaging through a box. These came in a month ago. Been so busy taking care of the backlog of repairs, I forgot to tell you about them. Come here. For an old woman, she was strong. She wrapped her knobby, arthritic fingers around my wrist and yanked. I got these mostly for you, kind of. You know me and my curious mind. 
There might be something in here. I peered into the box and frowned. Those are not in English. No. They aren't. I lifted the first one and read the title on the spine. It was in what would appear to be Latin, but the letters were in the wrong order. This is the language of the first witches. Rose, where the hell did you find this? They're all like that. A collector in Romania finally bit the dust. His relatives auctioned off his book collection. He had quite the number of volumes on witches. Even before I started working for Rose and she found out my secret, she had a fascination with witchcraft and magic. Her collection of works was on par with mine, though most of hers were written by crazy women who thought that dancing naked under a full moon brought one immense power and understanding. These books though were real. I sensed the magic on them. I think whatever's wrong with your magic might be in here. A curse maybe. Or something about skipping generations, Rose said as she pulled out more and stacked them on a nearby table. I want you to use these, see if you can't find a way to save your magic. I ran my fingers over the spines and shrugged. Maybe it's not worth it. Most of what I do doesn't require crazy powerful magic. I might be able to keep doing it. Rose took a firm hold of both my hands and arched her brow. You are a witch, Beckett. You were given an amazing gift. Do not let them take that away from you. Don't. Prove them wrong. She cupped my cheek and smiled. Magic is a part of who you are. You can't stand there and tell me you want to end up a boring mortal like me. You're hardly boring, I replied, but I wasn't looking at her anymore. These books were old. If anything was to give me answers on my current situation, it might be them. She guided me to a chair, sat me down, and promised she'd be back with more cider and whiskey. I picked up the first book and let it fall open before me. Right then, research time. Chapter 2 Finnick Two more people came around the corner at the far end of the street. I smacked Garth in the shoulder and nodded toward them. Your turn. He laughed as he handed over the bottle of never-ending red wine. This should be good. Two little old ladies out for a stroll. The four demis with us laughed as Garth saluted, then with a snap of his fingers became invisible to the mortal eye. We did the same and kept our places atop the wall. We were perched on the stone wall that surrounded one of the local cemeteries in Seattle. It was an older one, and the people who passed by claimed it was haunted. I'd been around enough ghosts and poltergeists, and whatever other undead spirits were around, to know there wasn't anything there. Every now and then, one of the old spookies would pop out of its grave, take a look around, then go back to doing whatever it was doing before. They weren't the ones howling and whispering in people's ears as they walked by. Nor were they tugging on their clothes. That was us. It was usually us. We had nothing better to do most days than to prank helpless mortals. We were the outcasts, the frowned-upon group of Demis that was a blemish on the rest of the gods. I was quite all right with that. I shoved my messy hair out of my face as Garth approached the two women. They had their coats clutched at their throats to fight against the chill in the late afternoon air. Garth was already laughing when he came up beside the woman on the right and tugged on her purse. She paused and looked around wide-eyed as the other woman asked what was wrong. She said nothing until Garth let out a pained wail between them. The women shrieked and ran faster than they probably had in years. He followed them all the way to the corner, then stopped, bent over double laughing. Not long after, a group of college-age guys walked by. A couple of them held beer bottles. Usually, I'd be nice and refill them or guide them to some epic party. All part of my heritage and that crap, seeing as my father was the go-to partier god, but I wasn't in a giving mood today. Besides, they looked like arrogant pricks. Just like the old man, whom I hated. I handed over the wine and hopped off the wall to join in the fun. I rushed forward and stood right in front of a muscle-bound one wearing a leather jacket. He seemed to be the leader of this bunch. Making him scream with fright would be highly entertaining. I waited until he was right in front of me, then whispered, Time to play a game, 
in the creepiest little kid voice I could. The guy tripped over his feet. His face went pale. What was that? What was what? His buddy next to him asked. Teddy, you okay? Ah, perfect. I winked at Garth as he circled around the group. He gave one guy a shove. Another, he poked in the face. They jumped and recoiled, eyes darting wildly. I stayed focused on Teddy as I used the creepy voice to say, Teddy, it's time to play a game. Won't you come play with me? That voice, Teddy shouted. This isn't funny, guys. We're not doing anything. Yeah, Teddy, another one chimed in when Garth gave him a shove. Hey. Seriously, who's doing that? Let's just go, Teddy muttered as he looked at the half-empty beer in his hand. I'd seen that look plenty of times before. He was contemplating never drinking again, trying to remember how much he'd had tonight. He set the bottle down and took a step forward, but he wasn't getting away from me that easily. I grabbed his arm as I sing-songed, time to play. Come play with me, Teddy, and dragged him toward the cemetery gate. Get off me, he screamed and yanked back, but I was stronger than a mortal. I gave him another tug. He flew off his feet and landed on the pavement. I let him go long enough to swing the metal gate inward, the ear-piercing squeak adding a nice touch. He scrambled backward, trying to get away. I snagged his ankle. Guys, he screeched. His friends were a bit occupied with Garth's pushing and shoving, but they rushed to his side and grabbed him around the middle. When they were pulling, I let Teddy's ankle go and watched the group go flying. I kept calling Teddy's name as they scrambled to get over one another other and sprinted down the sidewalk. Garth and I shook hands on a job well done. Glad to see you are having some fun, he said as we headed back to the wall. I'm always having fun. That's what I'm about, isn't it? We Demis were an interesting lot. At least to me, we were. We'd all inherited different gifts based on who our godparent was, but we also had a bit of simple basic god power and strength running through our veins. Just enough to make us not mortal, and not enough to make us count as gods. Hasn't been these last few weeks. Garth laid his hand on my arm. Is it your mother? I thought she was getting better. I jerked away from him. I'll catch you later. Finnick, come on, Garth said. We're just worried about you. I'm fine and my mother is fine, I snapped. I'll just, I'll see you later. Finnick, Garth yelled after me as I stormed away. You know I'm asking because I care about you. I waved at him over my shoulder and ignored his calling until he was too far away to make out what he was saying. Mortals have these romanticized ideas about demigods and how great it must be to have powers and have one parent that's a god. Not that humans believe there's more than one god, but that's not my problem. My problem is that they think our lives are perfect. I remained invisible as I walked through the streets of Seattle, not caring when I brushed past people or caused several cars to, for no apparent reason to the driver, slam on their brakes so I could cross the street. Mortals are oblivious to so much. Though I'd never admit it, I was jealous. Jealous of their ability to imagine that being anything but mortal is incredible. I mean, yeah, my powers came with some perks. I could create parties out of nothing. Ensure everyone's drinks never ran out. Thanks to my godly father, my good looks landed me just about any goddess or demigoddess I wanted. But most of the partier side of me that everyone saw was just there to cover up the burning anger growing inside me for years. My father was nothing but a useless piece of garbage that didn't deserve to have powers. He shouldn't be immortal. Especially not while my mother was left to suffer here on the surface. Rotten bastard. The only time I ever saw him was when we were summoned together for festivals or blessings. He never spoke to me and he stayed far away from my mother. I glanced up as I came to a stop outside a set of iron gates set in a stone archway. I was near the northern edge of the city, across from a park with a fountain in the center. It was dedicated to gods that mortals thought were nothing but fantasy. I didn't bother turning to look at it, since one of the faces carved into it was of Dion. My darling dad. 
My lip twitched in disgust, but I pushed any thoughts of him aside and focused on why I was at the sanitarium. It had been two days since I'd been here. The last visit hit me hard, and I'd been fighting with myself to come back. But she didn't deserve to be left alone. As I stepped through the gate, the lights on the arch lit up a deep blue, signifying a non-mortal had entered the premises. This wasn't just any sanitarium. This one was run by gods and demis, and took care of those mortals who had fallen victim to our influence. There were gods housed here too, but it was mostly mortal patients. Finnick, a woman said the second I stepped through the double front doors. The atrium was well lit by an overhead antique silver chandelier. Wall sconces led the way down three different halls and framed the main desk where the woman greeted me. I was worried about you. Just fine, Elisa, I said as I walked to the counter to sign myself in. You didn't seem fine the other day. Wearing the typical blue robes for healers, she came around the corner. Her dark brown hair was pulled back in a clip, and her full lips smiled sympathetically as she placed her hand on my shoulder. You know we're all here for you. I know, I just didn't want to bug anyone. She gave my shoulder a little squeeze and leaned in. You can always bug me. It's been a while, you know, since we've really talked, she added in a whisper. I know this probably isn't the best time, but I miss you. Elisa was a beauty, and quite a few gods and demis had tried to woo her over the years. She was brilliant and quite the looker. I'd won her over easily enough, and we had a casual fling every now and again, just like I had with numerous others over the years. Most of them caught on pretty fast that it would never be a real relationship. Not Elisa. I smiled and leaned down enough that I could kiss her cheek. As much as I told myself I should be backing off, the stress from dealing with my mother was getting to me. A distraction was never a bad thing. It was one of the main reasons I spent so much time with random women. Distraction. Probably be throwing a party later to drown my sorrows away, I whispered in her ear. Care to join me? We can catch up then. Yeah, sure, she said, blushing. I, uh, I'll be off at midnight. Perfect. See you at my place. I'll be there. She grinned as I winked and turned toward the right. The whole time I was walking away, I sensed her eyes on me. Most times, I'd throw one more charming smile over my shoulder, but not tonight. I ambled down the hall, turned right, then left, nodding at the healers I passed. Random shouts and screams echoed around the large stone building. It appeared far smaller on the outside than it actually was. It had taken me months to figure out my way around without getting lost. Now I could walk to my mother's room with my eyes closed. She was placed in a suite on the main level in the west wing, so she could overlook the lily garden. Lilies were her favorite flower, and one of the few things that kept her calm. I ground my teeth every time she'd tell me to look at those flowers. Dion had given her a whole house full of them when he first seduced her. Then he'd broken her. My fist nearly fell without knocking, but I'd come all this way. I had to see her. Mother! I said as I knocked. It's Finnick. There was no answer. Mom? Still nothing. I ran a hand through my hair and called louder. Flora? Yes. The doors open, a cheerful voice replied. Sorry, my hands are covered in charcoal. I forced a smile and opened the door. My mother sat at the bay windows with an easel in front of her. The blonde hair that was the same shade as mine was brushed today. She wore a blue sweater and had a quilt draped across her lap. She gave me the briefest of looks over her shoulder. Did you come to see my sketches? She asked eagerly as she turned back to her work. They're not finished, but if you tell me the date of the show, I can have them done by then. I shoved my hands in my front pockets. You've got about a month, I said, used to this scenario. It was the most common one she played out. My mother had been an artist, once upon a time. Dion always did have a weakness for the arts, and those who could bring such passion to life through art. At least when her sanity went, her ability to draw didn't. I glanced. I saw what she'd been drawing and quietly cursed. That's ah, uh, that's an interesting one. 
Yeah. She leaned back and studied it, her fingers covered in charcoal. I keep seeing his face in my dreams. Figured he'd make a good subject. I managed to nod. The beaming smile of Dion, the god of festivals, looked back at me from the page. She'd even managed to capture a smile in his shifting green eyes. A smile that matched mine. What was your name again? She asked as she went back to her sketch. Finnick. The charcoal paused on the paper, and I held my breath. I like that name. She went back to drawing. I let out the breath and wandered around her apartment. She was sane enough to at least have a small kitchen, unlike some residents here who were prone to starting fires. The sound of the charcoal being dragged across the page was soothing and took me back to the early years when my mother was still my mother. When she knew who I was. The days she was lucid were fewer and farther between. Two days ago, she'd been talking to me in mid-sentence when she suddenly started screaming about snakes in her veins. They had to sedate her. I rested my arm against the window and looked at the lilies I'd planted specifically for her. Seeing every last one of them die was my wish, but if they kept her happy, then I'd leave the innocent flowers alone. You look sad, she said. I turned to find her standing just a few feet away. She raised her hand to my cheek and frowned. Finnick, what's wrong? Did Dion do something again? I let out a heavy sigh as I covered her hand with mine. No, everything's just fine. You know you're a terrible liar. She hugged me. I feel like I haven't seen you in ages. On to your next girlfriend yet. You know one of these days, it'd be nice if you settled down with one woman. I'd like to be a grandmother. Can we have any other conversation besides this one? I begged, willing this moment to stay as long as possible. Anything else? If that's what you want, she said with a wink and a grin. A mother has to ask. A mother can bug her son about anything else. Fine, have it your way. Her smile faltered and she asked quietly, Have you spoken to him at all lately? All right, I lied. You can talk to me about anything other than grandkids, women, and him. He's your father. And I don't have to like him. Wait, I said when she looked guilty. Has he been by to see you? She shrugged. He might have stopped by a few days ago. And then you had one of your worst episodes yet. I'm going to drown that bastard in wine. You're going to do no such thing, she argued hotly. It's not his fault. You're kidding, right? You have to live here because of him. You're not well, and it's all because of him. How can you still love him? I ranted. I don't understand you. I don't understand any of this. I motioned to the easel, to the sketch of Dion. How? Just explain to me how. Her eyes narrowed. She opened and closed her mouth several times. I waited for her to go into a long-winded explanation of exactly why, but the words that came out of her mouth next had my heart pounding and yelling for help. Snakes, she whispered then screamed as she started to claw at her arms. Get them out. Get them out. I rushed forward and grabbed her arms, then held her against my chest so she couldn't hurt herself. The first time she had a fit like this, I hadn't gotten to her in time, and she'd clawed the crap out of her arms. I held her as she kicked and shrieked about snakes trying to eat her alive from the inside. The door to her apartment burst open. Dr. Gillis and four orderlies ran inside. Hold her steady, Gillis said as he placed his hand against my mother's forehead. His palm glowed and that just set her off more. She bashed her head back into my nose. I grunted but kept a firm grip on here. You're all right, Flora, you're all right. There are no snakes. Sleep now. Just sleep. His hand glowed a brighter blue with his words. My mother stopped screaming. She went limp in my arms. The orderlies helped me carry her to bed. I tucked her in then kissed her forehead. Less than five minutes. That's how long I'd been able to speak to my mother tonight. Less than five damn minutes. I backed away to let her get some rest and joined Gillis in the hallway outside her apartment door. She's getting worse, I muttered. 
Is there nothing you can do to stop the madness from spreading? Gillis removed his glasses, cleaning them with his shirt. You know I can't. I balled up my fist, ready to take my frustrations out on the wall, but stopped at the last second. Gillis was telling the truth. He'd been working with my mother for years, to make her comfortable and keep her safe. If he could have stopped her from getting worse, he would have. Listen, I know you might not want to hear this, but it might be a good idea to take a break from visiting her every day, he said gently. I think you should really consider giving her a week in between. Maybe even longer. You think I'm causing her episodes? Gillis replaced his glasses, then tucked his hands in the deep pockets of his robes. I want to say no, but there's a chance you are. You do look like your father. She still loves him, though. But subconsciously, she might be fighting against anything that reminds her of him. I don't want to make this any harder than it needs to be, but Flora's case is severe. Think it over. If there are any major changes, if she's lucid for more than a few minutes, I'll send word. I stayed in the hallway as he walked away with the orderlies. I took one step back toward my mother's door to see her one more time, then stopped myself. She needed rest, and I needed a break. Keeping up appearances these last six months had been a pain. Garth was the only one who knew some of what I was going through. The rest were either too wrapped up in their own lives to care, or just simply didn't. That's how we Demis were. Arrogant, self-absorbed assholes, all except Garth. Calling the others my friends was a stretch. They hung out with me because I was party-hard Finnick. I was tired of the games, though, and so tired of making everybody believe I was happy and carefree all the time. I left the sanitarium behind and wandered across the street to the park. I circled the statue of the gods from legends and tales until I came face to face with Dion's likeness. You see what you did to her? I snapped, not caring about the few people passing by. They gave me odd looks, then hurried away. You're breaking her. Every day, she's coming apart more and more. Are you happy with that, huh? Are you happy you destroyed the woman you claim to love? I should have known better. It's all one big fat lie, I yelled as I spread my arms wide. Love doesn't exist, right? Just something you gods made up so you can toy with mortals' hearts. I shook my head as I stomped away, then came right back and pointed an accusing finger at Dion's face. I know all about your past. I hope you know that. You can't convince me, or anyone else that you actually loved her. I'll make you pay for this. One day, you are going to pay. Dion's stone face remained that. Stone. He wasn't there, and I doubted he ever heard any of my rants. I glowered at the face, then snapped my fingers. The handsome stone features crumbled to dust and fell into the pool of water. Too bad I couldn't do that for real. Dion was a god, and I was just the half-breed son he didn't seem to care about. I could never figure out how many bastards he had running around. Anytime I brought that topic up with my mother, she'd get mad at me and tell me to stop it. That when Dion met her, he stopped sleeping around, and that as far as she knew, he had only one son. It was why she wanted me to get to know him. How could she ask me to do that when I had to watch her suffer day after day? I stormed away from the fountain and sank onto the nearest bench, not ready to go wallow in my apartment just yet. As a demi, I have to do some sort of work. My job, if it could even be called that, involved carrying out summons for the gods. They didn't think I could handle being around mortals without causing more messes for them to clean up. It worked fine for me. I didn't have to go to an office every day. I just had to be available for when one god needed something sent to another. It was what most Demis did, meaning we had plenty of free time to do whatever we wanted. Some days that was a rotten curse. I rubbed a hand down my face as I sulked on the bench. The evening gave way to the night, and the air grew colder. I was bent over double, glaring at a crack in the sidewalk when someone sat down on the bench beside me. It creaked as the person shifted. I frowned. Ready to tell the person off for not taking one of the open seats, I sat up and blinked in surprise. Karina! 
The witch sat, legs crossed and arms draped casually over the back of the bench. She wore her typical black dress with a red corset. Her white blonde hair blew lightly in the wind. The smile that spread across her lips was not, however, the typical one she used to seduce men. It was darker, and eyes that were normally a bright shade of blue were violet, with magic swirling in their depths. The sight of it had the hair on my neck standing on end. I might be a demi, but Karina was a strong witch. Powerful. And she belonged to a coven that bordered on the dark arts, though the witch council had yet to officially call them out for the type of magic they used. Finnick. It's been a while, she said quietly. What do you want? She whistled, and the wind completely stopped blowing. My, such a tone you take with me. Can't a girl just pop in to say hello? I figured you'd want nothing to do with me. Her smile turned into a sneer as her violet eyes shifted their gaze to me. A heavy weight settled on my chest, and I found it hard to breathe. You really think you can just up and leave me after what we had together? That I'll let you go? What we had was called lust, I reminded her. That's it. I'm sorry if you ever thought it was more, but I don't believe in that shit. Get over it. Move on. I stood and intended to walk away, only to find my feet were stuck to the ground. What are you doing? Karina rose and walked leisurely around me, dragging her long black nails across my shoulders. I gave you my heart, Finnick. Gave you everything I had, and you, you stomped on it. You're no better than your darling father. Don't you dare compare me to him, I snarled. Why not? It's only a matter of time before you do the same to me, is it not? Drive me mad even though deep down I know you feel for me too. I snapped my fingers and my feet came free. I feel nothing for you. I never promised you anything. You knew exactly who I was when you asked me out for drinks that first time. I backed up a step, not trusting her at all. A few weeks ago, we'd been lying on the couch at my place when she said she loved me. I had done what I always did when a woman said that to me. I laughed. She'd left in a hurry with me still laughing on the couch. Love wasn't real. It was what I told every woman I ended up with. I assumed Karina would have gotten over my rejection by now. Apparently, I was wrong. When she said nothing, I walked away faster, but then she suddenly appeared in front of me. She grabbed my face in her hands and dug her nails into my cheeks. Oh no, you're not getting away with it that easily. Away with what? I asked as I tore her hand from my face. You humiliated me. You broke me apart without a care for my life. All the gods and Demis do. You all think you can use us whenever you want and toss us away like trash, yet you forget how powerful we are. I started to argue, but her words rang true. I told myself repeatedly I was nothing like Dion, but how many women had I used to get what I wanted? How many hearts had I broken? You can't do anything to me, I told her lamely. I'm sorry if you're upset, but you can't make someone love you. And I don't. You're right about that, but I can make you pay. Not about to have a witch cast any magic on me, I imagined her surrounded by a group of partying witches. My illusions were extremely powerful. If I wasn't careful around mortals, they could grow lost in them for days at a time. Karina would at least be trapped in this illusion long enough for me to slip away. It'd suck her in until she was drunk on it. I snapped my fingers and waited for the images to take form, but nothing happened. I snapped my fingers again and again, but Karina merely rolled her eyes. She reached for a black chain hanging around her neck and lifted the pendant from her dress. You really think I wouldn't come prepared? The pendant was of a large, green eye. It blinked. I staggered back a step. What the hell is that? Magic, very good magic, she said as she let it drop so it hung on the outside of her corset watching me. Is that a real eye? She shrugged. So what if it is? You're sick, you're all sick, I yelled as I backed away. Sick and crazy. She threw back her head and cackled like the stereotypical evil witch would in one of those cheesy movies. 
Perhaps you're right. Either way, you're about to pay the price for so many sins gone unpunished. She raised her hands as the violet in her eyes glowed. Power flowed down her arms to her fingers, and as I raised my arm to do whatever I could to stop her, she shouted three words. The syllables were harsh, and they slammed into my chest one after the other. I gasped for air and fell to my knees. The world spun, and it was like something was crawling through my body trying to get out. Karina laughed as she moved closer and tilted my face up with one sharp nail. Enjoy your curse, she whispered for it's about to take everything from you, just as you stole everything from me. As quietly as she appeared, she vanished. I toppled over and looked up at the night sky. My breathing wheezed for what seemed like an hour, until finally I was able to push myself upright again. My body was intact, and I didn't feel as though I was going to lose my mind. Maybe her curse hadn't worked. I used a nearby bench to climb to my feet, then unsteadily walked home. This day was certainly one for the books. Maybe it was time I took a vacation. A very long vacation. Disappeared. Karina's spell whispered through my mind again, and I tripped over my feet, frantically searching the park for her. She was gone. I picked up the pace and told myself it had all just been some crazy dream. Nothing more. Chapter 3 Beckett. It had been over a week since Rose showed me the old books. I'd been spending as much time as I could searching through them. I knew how to read the first language of my kind, but it took time. A long time. And I wasn't exactly as fluent as I thought, by page three of the first book. I'd had to sneak into my mother's place, and take a few of her old guides. Every moment I wasn't working with my plants, filling orders, or taking care of customers at the bookstore, I was translating and sifting through every bit of information these books provided. The first one hadn't been much help, though there was a fascinating chapter on a rare species of a rose that hadn't been around in decades. According to the description, if a witch was able to grow it in the correct environment with enough magic, the petals, once they were crushed down into a tonic, could cure madness. I'd been working on remedies for the mind over the years, but not all of them were successful. The mind was just as fickle as the heart. Messing with it could lead to catastrophe if the one doing the messing around wasn't careful. I'd marked that chapter and taken the book home to my loft. Frankie had been helping me in the early morning hours to see if it was even possible to try. The second book had been nothing but mad ramblings that made absolutely no sense. That book gave me a headache which had lasted the last three days. The third book appeared to be nothing but curses against ex-lovers, a book I assumed was written by an angry heartbroken witch. The fourth book, however, seemed to have some interesting notions about how a witch's magic worked. I'd been up most of the night translating it. I stifled another yawn as the clock in the shop chimed nine. Damn, guess the next chapter will have to wait. I rose from the old, leather chair in the back of the shop and stretched my arms over my head. I marked the page I was on, tucked my notes under the heavy black leather cover and shut the volume. I tucked it gently inside my satchel and rubbed my eyes. I should get some sleep tonight. My mother's deadline for binding my powers loomed closer, and sleep was a very important part of maintaining one's state of mind. Figuring out if there was a reason that I was not to blame for my magic was important too though. Coffee, I muttered, yawning again. I'll just be living off coffee and catnaps until you figure this out. No big deal? None at all. It's either this or bye-bye magic. I stacked the remainder of the books on the table and shut off the lamp on the nearby table. I was about to head up front to take the cash out of the drawer and lock the front up when the chimes rang. Someone entered the shop. I inwardly groaned for not paying closer attention to the time. Be right there, I called. We do close at nine, though, so if you can tell me what you're looking for, I can help us both get out of here quicker. There was no reply. I frowned. Stopping halfway up the ramp to the main shop, I reached into my pocket for the small box cutter. I readied a force field spell with my left hand, though I didn't count on it working. Hello? I waited for an answer, 
but there was no reply except for the creaking of the floorboards near the front stacks. I'd hung the raven sword up four days ago. There should be no way a spirit found its way inside. Look, this isn't funny. If you don't respond right now, I'm going to unleash a powerful spell that'll ah make your bones turn to goo. Unless of course you're a ghost and already dead, I added and wanted to smack myself in the forehead for that. No bones to goo, a male voice yelled. Sorry, I'm looking for someone. Going to guess you're it. I need your help. I tucked the blade away, but kept the force field spell ready. Crap, was it a mortal that I just told that confession to? Help with finding a book? Maybe, if you think it'll help. He cleared his throat. Can you please come out? I'm not here to hurt you or anything, but I really need your help. I'm a bit desperate. You're Beckett Jenkins, right? Last time I checked, I said confused. I took a few more steps up the ramp. No one ever asked for me. Ever. Unless it was for ingredients or a plant remedy. You sure you're not looking for Harriet Jenkins? No, not her, he shot back in a rush. I was told to look for you. My curiosity finally got the better of me, and I walked quickly up the ramp and through the shop, until a wave of power hit me. This wasn't a mortal or a witch. He was something else entirely. Standing near the front counter was a tall, lean guy with hair that made me jealous. It was messy but looked great. The light caught eyes that were green one second, then shifted to a dark blue the next. He tapped his fingers on the countertop, and his red shirt was crumpled under a black leather jacket. And those jeans. I found myself tilting my head as I checked him out, and probably would have done it a bit longer if he hadn't smirked and waved. Hi. Oh hi. Sorry. I closed my hand around the force field spell as my cheeks burned. You're a demigod, right? Yeah, I am. Finnick. He held out his hand for mine, and after a second I took it. His palm was warm. I gripped his hand far longer than was necessary. His smile widened and I finally let go. Sorry if I freaked you out. It would have been nice if you answered me the first time around. His smile fell and he rubbed the back of his neck. Yeah, sorry about that. I was having a hard time getting words out. I crossed my arms and nodded slowly. Okay. We looked at each other for a long while until I finally burst out laughing. His brow furrowed. Do I have something on my face? He asked, and I shook my head. Are you drunk? No, probably been awake for too damn long doing research, but no. I'm sorry, I've met Demis before and none of them have acted like you. At a loss for words, apparently. And Finnick. I know your name, I said slowly as I recalled the stories the witches at the Coven home told. You're quite popular amongst our kind. He paced away from the front counter muttering, that'd be why I'm here. I don't follow. Look, I need your help with an issue. A magical issue, and you weren't exactly my first option, but I think you're the only one I have. I whistled at his word choice. My amused look turned into a glare. Wow, that took a whole what three minutes before you piss me off and you want my help. Why should I help you? And with what? You seem perfectly fine to me. Why don't you ask one of your many other witchy friends to help you, then you can get out of here. Sounds like a plan to me. I moved to escort him toward the door. He held up his hands and planted his feet. I'm not asking, Finnick. You don't understand. I didn't mean to insult you, though I'll admit what I've heard about your magical issues doesn't exactly make me feel any better. I scoffed and shoved him. Out. Now. He caught my hands and spun us around, so I was the one with my back to the front door. I'm not good at asking for help, all right? But I need it. Just hear me out, please. You've given me no reason to do that. You're the demi-god of celebrations, and all that if I remember correctly. The least you could do is offer a girl a drink, while you insult me about what a failure I am. Trust me, if I could, I would. It'd make this conversation much easier. You're telling me. Look, he snapped. I arched a brow at him. 
He took a deep breath, let it out, and hung his head. I'm sorry. I haven't been myself this last week. I haven't slept, and before this incident occurred, I was having trouble, and all I'm asking for is five minutes. Please. I considered telling him to F off. I had enough on my plate as it was, but when I took another look at him, I swallowed back the words. He looked like a damned raccoon with the bags under his eyes. His face, though still extremely attractive, was a bit on the gaunt side the longer I looked at him. The light within his eyes seemed duller than when I first spotted him. I groaned, I was too good of a person to turn him away. You want to talk, then talk, I said and moved around him to the counter. I hopped up on it and waved him on. Come on. I have work to do still tonight, so out with it. What could a witch, with a terrible reputation do for you? I sat cross-legged, and waited impatiently for him to tell me his woes. A tiny part of me wondered if this was some elaborate prank, but then he dragged over one of the armchairs from the front window, sank into it, and started talking. I was cursed, he blurted. Happy? I shrugged. A lot of people are cursed. Doesn't explain why you came to me. Isn't it obvious? It was a witch who cursed me. I held up my hand. I have to stop you right there. It's a major taboo for one witch to remove the curse of another. You should know that. Which means my hands are tied. I can't help you. I'm sorry. I know the rules, all right? But I also know they're just a code you guys have. It's not a law or anything. You won't lose your powers if you do it. He dug his fingers into the fabric of the chair arms. I'm desperate here. Can't you see that? You have to help me. I don't have to do anything, and you seem fine to me. What's this curse anyway? He straightened and wouldn't meet my gaze. I'd rather not say. It's a bit humiliating. That's it? Just humiliating? Finn look I... Finnick, he cut me off. It's Finnick. I clamped my lips and reminded myself to be nice. For now. Finnick, there are people out there with actual life and death situations. I'm more prone to help those people than someone who was cursed with utter humiliation. You'll live with it, and if you can't, then I suggest you track down the witch who cursed you and ask her to remove it. He cringed. I don't think that's a good idea. She hates me. What did you do? It's a long story, he started to say, and I shrugged again. He blew out a breath and slouched in the chair. She claims I stole her heart then broke it. And? His eyes narrowed on my face. And what? Did you? He screwed his mouth to the side, then leapt up from the chair to pace in front of me. Does it matter? We had a fling, that was it and I told her so. Then she decided to say she loved me, and I laughed in her face. I couldn't help it. I laughed at him. Seriously? Just go and apologize to her. Bring her some flowers or something. Girls like that stuff. You make it sound so simple. It's a hell of a lot simpler than you trying to convince a witch to remove the curse of another witch. But you don't care about that. You're the rebel. I figured this would be something you could do. And you know if it works, which I'm really praying it does, then you can prove you're not a failure. He said it with the biggest grin on his face, like that was supposed to make me feel better. You have a really terrible way of asking for help. And for the record, I am damned good with magic when I need to be. I have a thriving business, and many people turn to me for help. Many, many people. I'm a good witch. I hopped off the counter and pointed to the door. If you'd come in here and asked me nicely, I might have considered it. Just apologize. I told you that wouldn't work. She's not that kind of witch. The way he said it made me think he was a bit scared of her. Who is she? He mumbled something, but it was too quiet for me to hear. He hung his head, then repeated himself. Karina from the Blood Moon Coven. My arms fell limply to my sides. Are you kidding me? I muttered, then doubled over in laughter. I swiped at the tears, as I managed another bout of laughter bubbled up. 
Finnick glowered at me the whole time, but I couldn't help it. I failed to see what's so entertaining, he snapped. You are a dumbass, I told him as I caught my breath. Not only did you manage to piss off a witch bad enough to curse you, but it also had to be her. She's borderline evil. What were you thinking? That she would be rational. What is it with you all? You really think there won't be consequences. I hate to tell you, but no one is going to help you lift a curse and face the wrath of Karina. I walked to the back room to gather up my stuff and gave him a chance to make an exit. When I returned to the front door though, he was still standing there looking lost and pissed all at the same time. Look, I have to lock up. Good luck and all, but I can't help you. I can't go to anyone else, he whispered. Then maybe you should have thought of that before you tangled with a bad witch. I sighed. Look, I'm sorry for whatever she did to you, but it can't be that bad. Go on with your life. I'm sure you'll survive, or she'll get bored and remove the curse on her own. No one else would even listen to me, he muttered solemnly. You're my last hope. I can't live like this. I won't. You have to help me. My hand was on the door, ready to push it open and shove him out, when an idea popped into my mind. If I did try to remove the curse, tried and succeeded, the elders and my mother would have to reconsider binding my powers. It could be my chance to prove I wasn't a danger, and that they could trust me. Then again, I could accidentally make the curse worse, or blow up Finnick, or get in trouble for trying to remove a curse placed by a very powerful, very dangerous witch. I'd be in worse shape than I already was. I'm sorry, I said again. That's my final word on it. I have my own issues to deal with. I pushed against the door as Finnick said my name. The door glowed and wouldn't budge in the frame. It was like it was glued in place. I frowned and pushed harder, then grunted in aggravation. You can't keep me locked in here, I said as I whipped around. I let out a yelp of surprise. Finnick was no longer standing in the bookstore. Instead there was a gray-haired jackass with large ears. Big brown eyes looked at me as he opened his mouth and let out a loud bray that made me jump all over again. He stomped his front hoof on the floor and came closer. Finnick! He bobbed his head, and the voice of the demigod emerged from the animal in front of me. Still going to say no. You can talk? Of course I can talk. Sort of. Sometimes it comes with a, his words were interrupted by a high-pitched braying sound that had him sighing heavily. This is humiliating. I blinked, trying to comprehend exactly what was happening. I uh I hum. How about we talk about this more, just not here. I don't want you to wake up Rose. She's the owner. Upstairs. Since we were already at the front door, I told him to stay put, and ran to lock up the back. When I returned to the front door, it was still glowing. Mind removing the lock? Can't use my powers when I'm like this. And how long does this last? About half an hour, he muttered, and let out another bray. Though this time, it sounded like he tried to stifle it. Gods, this is awful. Can't you just open the door? I shook out my hands and rolled my head on my shoulders. Yeah, of course I can. Somewhere, I heard a warning in the back of my mind say this was a terrible idea, but we couldn't sit here for half an hour or longer. I shut my eyes and held my hands to the door. The warming sensation that came with my magic rose from my center, and I focused on unlocking it. A burst of light shot from my hands. When I opened my eyes, I grimaced. Are those bubbles? Finnick asked behind me. Yeah, they are. Just give me a second. You made bubbles. How did you even do that? Will you shut up? I muttered and refocused on the door. This time when a burst of power shot out, a rain cloud appeared over Finnick. It drizzled on him as I tossed my satchel on the counter and cracked my knuckles. The rain cloud dispersed quickly enough, but the strong scent of wet donkey made me sneeze just as I released my third spell. I squinted open one eye then the other, not sure what I'd done. How weird. What is? I turned around and froze. Ara, are donkeys colorblind by chance? I think so, why? 
I turned back toward the door so he wouldn't see my smile. Nothing, ah, uh, you just might be bright pink with purple spots right now. Seriously? Beckett. What? You're making me nervous. Just shut your eyes or something. He let out a prolonged grunt that turned into a bray then fell silent. I didn't sense his gaze on me anymore, and when I thought about releasing the door from Finnick's magical hold, I heard a muffled pop. This time when I looked to the door, the glow was gone. I pushed against it and it swung outward. Ha! See! I can do magic just fine. Perfect. He might not have been able to do much by facial expressions, but I figured he was scowling at me. Hey, you want my help or not, jackass? I laughed and guided the bright pink animal out of Rose's shop. He wouldn't fit in my truck, which meant we'd be walking. I had a broom shrunken down to size in my bag, but no way was I attempting a spell that would get him in the air for that long of a time. How far away do you live? Not far. I can try to magic us closer if you want, I said, but he shook out his short mane of black hair. That's what I thought. Nice night for a walk, at least. He didn't reply except to start walking, until I told him it was the other direction. The sound of his hooves on the sidewalk and my boots were as much conversation as we managed. My life was certainly about to get much more interesting. I wondered what Frankie would say when I showed up with a pink jackass. Chapter 4 Finnick The second the steel doors came into view, I planted all four hooved feet and shook my massive head. This was the longest that I'd been stuck in this hideous form. Each second made me go into a panic over whether I'd change back or be stuck like this forever. What's wrong? Beckett asked as she hit the up button for the elevator. You want my help or not? I can't get into that thing, I muttered and brayed loudly. The sound echoed around the lobby, but thankfully we were alone. I wasn't sure how she'd explain why there was a bright pink jackass with her. Everyone would think she was crazy. I'll take the stairs. You're not climbing all the way to the top floor. You live that high up. She rolled her eyes and hit the up button again. You'll be fine all right. It's the only way to get you to my place. Can't exactly leave you down here unless you want a lot of attention. I turned all the way around, but we were still alone. I'll be fine till it wears off. And when will that be? You said it yourself, it's not very reliable. The doors dinged and opened by the time I turned back to face her. In my demi-form, I had no issues whatsoever with elevators. None at all. In this animal state, every instinct screamed at me to hightail it the other direction. Getting in that tiny cramped space would be the death of me. I had no idea how I knew that but it would. Beckett came toward me and I backed away. My hooves slipped on the slick floor. I struggled to move any distance at all. You're ridiculous, she complained as she wrapped her arms around my beefy neck and tugged. Finnick, just get in the elevator. I brayed louder and for a few terrible seconds felt every bit the animal I'd been turned into. Beckett stopped trying to tug on me, blew the hair out of her eyes, and walked around behind me. I had no idea what she was planning on doing until she put her shoulder against my hindquarters and pushed. I moved about a foot then staggered back. She grunted and pushed me harder. The doors had closed by now, but she kept pushing me forward. My hooves gave way, and I slid a good yard, then heard a thud behind me along with a very feminine-sounding grunt. A quick glance over my shoulder showed me Beckett sitting on the floor, shaking her head. You are a massive pain in my ass, she muttered as she climbed to her feet. I have enough of my own problems, and you just had to come into that bookstore and guilt trip me into helping you. Hey, I'm the one who's currently pink thanks to you. She cringed a bit. With purple spots, she added. You just had to remind me. What? It'll go away once you change back. I think. You think? I shouted and brayed at the same time. Did you permanently mess me up more than I already am? Oh, pipe down, you look good in spots. She winked, 
and despite the anger and panic that had been building in me since the first time I transformed into this creature, I wished I could smile right along with her. I wanted to burst out laughing until I was crying on the floor. Here I was, a bright pink and purple spotted jackass in the lobby of her apartment building. This was the most ridiculous situation I'd ever been in, and that was saying something. I hung my heavy head as the elevator doors opened again with a ding. Care to try again? she asked, grinning. Her eyes lit up, from dark storm cloud gray to a pale smoky color that I found myself drawn to. She tilted her head as her brow crinkled. Finnick? Huh? You're staring at me like I've got two heads or something. Didn't think I could make facial expressions. She shoved her hands in the pockets of her pants. Yeah, well, that's what it feels like. How about I, uh, try a spell to calm you down? I'm usually pretty good with those. Entranced by those eyes, I agreed. It couldn't be any worse than what had happened to me already. I shut my eyes as she lifted her hands toward me. She whispered a spell, and then the anxiety over the elevator vanished. My body grew tingly, and then it was over. I opened one eye then the other, and looked at Beckett. Or rather looked up at her. She had one hand clapped over her mouth, and her eyes were wide. I tried to speak to ask what she did to me now, but all that came out was a squeak. I looked down at myself and squeaked more as I ran around in circles to try and get a good look at myself. A mouse. She turned me into a freaking white mouse. I ran up to her boots and tried to climb up, squeaking as I mentally yelled at her. Yeah, I hear you, she said as she picked me up and let me sit on her palm. On the bright side, you can get in the elevator now. I wasn't sure if a mouse could glare, but that was what I did. Glared as the doors opened a third time, and she carried me inside. She hit the number six and hummed to herself while she avoided looking at me. I was tempted to bite her finger, but settled down in the warmth of her hand. She hadn't cursed me. She wasn't the reason I was in this mess, to begin with. Sorry, she said and let out a heavy sigh. Whatever Karina did to you is messing with my magic. An indignant squeak escaped my now tiny body, and I shut my eyes. A week ago, my biggest problem had been worrying about how quickly my mother was going insane and how to get revenge against Dion. I'd been plotting for a way to make him remove the madness, then swear he'd never go near her again. Then Karina had to get all emotional and pissed off at me for what, laughing at her when she confessed her love. She should have known better. Or not gotten so attached. I'd spent the last week going over all our time together, trying to figure out if I'd led her on. As far as I could remember, I never once gave her any indication that I was after an actual relationship. Or that I cared for her in that way. I had a reputation for a reason. No woman, witch or demi or goddess, managed to tie me down. Love wasn't real. Just some made-up bullshit. That was it. It never existed. Karina was completely overreacting, and I was paying the price for her irrational behavior. Witches. Once Beckett lifted the curse, I was never going near one again. I took a gander at my little white furry body and tucked my tail and head in as close as I could. Whether Beckett could remove the curse was what I should be thinking. I'd only come to her because I'd run out of options. Half the witches I had history with laughed in my face when I told them about my dilemma. Those who still kind of liked me enough to consider helping me turned me away at the sound of Karina's name. That, and as Beckett said, it was taboo for one witch to remove the curse of another. They'd shoved me out their door so fast, I wasn't sure how I'd even gotten on the threshold. And I wasn't an idiot. Beckett was only helping me because it might help her. Might was the keyword. From what I'd heard over the years, the daughter of the great Harriet Jenkins was a major disappointment. She was essentially cast out from her own coven, though it wasn't quite made official. I never heard the whole story and didn't care to either. I only had pity enough in me for one person. And that was me. Beckett could keep her sad life story all to herself as long as she removed this curse. 
After an eternity, we reached the sixth floor, and Beckett exited the elevator. She held out her left hand, with me in it, as she fumbled in the satchel across her body for keys, muttering under her breath the entire time. She cursed several times, and when she finally found them, let out an excited shout. Curly hair framed her face, and those greenish-gray eyes glimmered in the hallway lights. She had a freckle on her right cheek just below her eye. I found myself thinking she looked cute when she grinned, like a little kid who found a piece of candy. Finnick? I squeaked, and my tiny body shuddered. What was I thinking? It didn't matter how attractive I found Beckett. She was going to remove this curse from me. That was it. End of story. Then no more witches. Ever. Beckett walked down the hall to the right and didn't stop until we reached a door at the end. Number six. She just slid the key into the lock and turned it when the familiar sensation of a thousand ants crawling across my skin took over. I squeaked and ran around in tight little circles on Beckett's hand to let her know to put me down. What are you doing? she exclaimed. You're going to fall. Just hang on a second. I nipped her finger, hoping that would make her drop me, but she clutched me tighter instead. My body glowed a bright green, and then we were falling as I shifted back into my normal human form. The door she'd unlocked clicked open as we tripped over our feet and tumbled inside as the last of the bright light faded. At the last second, I grabbed her in my arms and spun us around. When we hit the floor, she landed on top of me. I grunted as the back of my head collided with the hard floor, then grunted a second time when all of Beckett's weight landed on me. She tried to shimmy off but ended up coming face to face with me. Sorry, she said with a grimace then started to laugh. I was surprised when a smile crept across my face. Smooth real smooth. This how you bring all the guys home. Wow all the guys huh? She shook her head as she climbed off me, then held out her hand for mine. Who do you think I am? She pulled me to my feet and then tripped over her own again, right into my chest. For a long, drawn-out second, we gazed into each other's eyes. Then she blinked and pulled away. What was wrong with me? I was here for a reason, and the flirting, or anything I did, was simply to get her to do what I wanted. That was it. Judging from the blush in her cheeks, she was not used to male attention. All I had to do was stay on her good side, and I'd be out of this mess in no time. What, you're a beautiful, smart, funny witch, I said with a shrug. What guy wouldn't want to be with you? The blush deepened. Then she burst out laughing, and I realized my mistake. I crossed my arms and waited for her to stop laughing. She took one look at me, and whatever she saw made her laugh harder. Are you insane or something? I snapped as she held a hand to her side. You are, if you think that shit will work on me. She wiped a tear from her eye. I've seen it all, so let's just stick to business. You need a curse lifted. Save the flattery for the next romantic sap you run across. Maybe that one will turn you into something useful when you stomp all over her heart. Her smile had turned to a scowl, and she crossed her arms as she stared me down. Judging me a bit harshly, aren't you? You tell me? What have you done throughout the course of your life for the mortals you're all supposed to look out for? Isn't that the job of anyone with God blood? It was my turn to laugh. I'm the son of Dion, you know, the god of good times and parties and all that shit. My job is to make sure mortals are entertained, and I've done that. Entertain them. Or you. I grimaced but didn't answer. Right. So maybe now would be a good time to rethink some of your life choices. She turned and started to walk away. I reached out and snagged her arm. I whirled her back around and glared at her. Don't you stand there and tell me I've messed up my life, I uttered. You have no idea what I've gone through. None. She yanked her arm free and didn't flinch in the face of my anger. All you've done since you came to me is insult me. I don't have to help you. I don't have to do anything for you. Remember that. Without me, you'll be stuck like that forever. Even as she said it, she studied me closely as if looking for answers. I backed up a step and glanced away. 
No one needed to know about my mother and her issues, or my hatred for Dion, especially not a witch. Fine, whatever. Just do what you need to do. She rubbed her forehead, then sighed. All right, look. I'm sorry. I am. And I'm not usually this much of a, of a, well, an unpleasant person, she finally said. I have some issues of my own, and they're making me extremely irritable. She held out her hand and offered a smile. I'll help you, but you gotta stop being an ass. Deal. Oh, and no more flirting. I already said I'd help you. I waited for a beat, then shook her hand. Deal. Do you not like being given compliments of any kind? When they're true, sure, but I'm not expecting any of that to come from you. Out heart. I followed her further into her place. It wasn't an apartment. It was a loft. Not that I could make out the whole thing. The railing around the upper floor was encased in thick, dark green vines with burnt orange flowers that looked like a form of lily. I'd never seen a lily growing on a vine, though. The foliage stretched along the balcony railing and around the ceiling. I slowly turned about, only to find she essentially lived inside a massive plant. Vines and plants covered the walls. They hung from tiered baskets that reached all the way to the ceiling. Bunches of dried herbs took up the right wall and surrounded the hearth and mantel, and a small cauldron inside. There were numerous wooden work tables with several high stools. Even her kitchen was taken over by plants, leaving just enough space for her stove, fridge, and a tiny two-seater table with chairs. Get you a beer, Beckett asked as she opened the fridge and disappeared behind the door. Yeah, I could use a drink. Something large, black, and fuzzy attached itself to my face. Belatedly, I realized it was a giant tarantula and tried to grab it as I cursed and stumbled back. Get this off me, I shouted. You're not going anywhere, a voice yelled, and I realized it was the spider. Intruder. Demi intruder. Come to hurt my mistress. What? I grabbed hold of the furry body and pulled, but its legs wouldn't budge. Pincers clicked very loudly against my face. I went to take another step, but something grabbed hold of my legs, stopping me from moving. Frankie, stop, Beckett yelled. I glanced down to see a shadow on the floor at my feet. Its arms were wrapped around my ankles, and it had a very similar shape to Beckett. The tarantula shifted on my face, dragging its body over my mouth. I gagged. Then it was pried off, and Beckett set it on the kitchen counter. What are you doing, huh? That is not how we treat guests. Either of you, she added, and glowered at the shadow still clutching at my ankles. Let him go. Now. The shadowy arm surrendered, but it didn't move away. Though it lacked a face, I sensed it glowering at me. I stepped over it and closer to Beckett. The spider aimed those pincers at me again, and all of its eight beady eyes. What the hell is that? I demanded. That is Frankie, she said as she pointed to the tarantula. My familiar. Though, usually, he's in a better mood. You told us never to let another one in, Frankie answered. That's what you said. Another one what? I asked as Beckett's cheeks turned bright red. Beckett? Nothing, it's nothing. We swore we wouldn't let any more in after the last one decided to. Shut up, Frankie. Beckett leaned down and whispered something to the tarantula. When she straightened, she returned to the fridge flustered. Right, Beers? Then we'll sit down, and I'll tell you how this is going to go. I nodded, keeping my eyes on the spider. It shifted and shimmered for a minute, then morphed into a large snail. I blinked a few times. The snail tilted its long neck. What? Never seen a snail before. He shapeshifts? Beckett handed me a beer. Yeah. I might have messed up my summoning spell. Most familiars have one form, and they can easily protect their witch. I, uh, goofed and somehow I ended up with Frankie and Frankie's less than pleasant other half. I eyed the snail warily as I sipped my beer. Right, yeah, totally makes sense. Beckett's eyes narrowed, but then she motioned to the small kitchen set. Have a seat. 
I did, my brow arching at the demanding tone in her voice. She joined me and brought with her a pen and pad of paper. Then she hopped back up from her chair and went to the hearth. She lit a fire beneath the cauldron the old-fashioned way and poured in water from a pitcher nearby. Once it was bubbling, she returned to her seat. Right, run me through what happened with you and Karina. I chugged down half my beer and slouched in the chair. Well, it was about a year ago when I first met her at a party and we hit it off. Then the next time we got together. No, Beckett said loudly. I meant in the park. Tell me what you remember from the park. I cleared my throat roughly and drained the rest of my beer. Right, sorry. You don't need all the dirty details. Definitely not. Sorry. I glanced at my empty beer bottle and almost snapped my fingers to have it refill itself. I sighed and set the empty bottle aside. We were in the park. We argued, then she blocked my magic with a creepy eyeball on a necklace. A real eyeball, by the way. She's a dark witch, not sure what you expected, Beckett murmured. Then what? I tried to leave, but she stopped me. She said a spell, three words. Just three. Do you remember what they were? I racked my memory of that dreadful night and shrugged. Lacta something. Or dacta something. There might have been a Z word in there. She snickered. Okay, so she said something, and then you what? Turned into a jackass. No, that didn't happen until the first time I used my powers. After the curse hit me, I was dizzy, and then it felt like something was crawling around my body trying to get out. I shuddered, remembering that sensation. Not very pleasant. Ha, huh, interesting. She jotted down a few more notes, then returned to the cauldron. Have you seen her since? No. I'm not about to track her down. Beckett used a ladle to pour boiling water into a black mug. She went to the work table closest to the cauldron and tilted her head as she ran her fingers over the bottles lining the shelves. Her lips as she read, and then she smiled and pulled one free. She poured something that looked like dried pieces of bark into the hot water and swirled it around. Drink this, she said once she set the mug in front of me. All of it. I peered at the floating chunks in the mug. Seriously? This payback or something? Just drink it. The chunks will stay in the mug, trust me. Are you going to read my tea leaves? I asked sarcastic, then picked up the mug. She went back to jotting down notes as I drank down the tea. The taste was bitter, I gagged it down. That was awful. Kick up bark. Very useful in helping figure out the base of most curses, she said. Kick up bark. Why is it called that? The question was barely out of my mouth when I hiccuped. That might be why. They should go away in a few hours. Great. I waited for her to tell me what she found in the mug, but she said nothing. The shadow that had grabbed my feet hovered on the wall next to Beckett. The snail had disappeared. I wasn't sure I was comfortable not having him in sight. You going to tell me why you agreed to help me? She turned the mug to the right and her brow furrowed. I am being nice. Why do I not believe that? Dunno, but that's on you. I'm going to spend the rest of the night doing some research. Why don't you come by tomorrow night around half past nine? I'll be back from work by then. I hiccuped again and stood. I guess I'll see you tomorrow night then. I backed away from the table, but Beckett didn't look up. Watching her work and whisper to herself under her breath was fascinating. It was like I wasn't even there, though I stood only a few yards away. Eventually, I left her loft and waited by the elevator so I could head home. I probably could have stayed there most of the night and watched her work. There was wild energy to Beckett. At first, I thought it had been nerves, but there was far more to this witch than just the failure her coven saw in her. I knew power. I had grown up around it all my life. And that witch in there had immense power, just under the surface, just waiting to be used. The question I left with was, why she hadn't tapped into it yet? Not that I cared. I shouldn't care. She was going to lift the curse, 
and then I'd never see her again. As I stood in the elevator going down, though, and looked at my reflection, I sighed. Yeah, right. You're about to get yourself in a world of trouble, my friend. Chapter 5 Beckett An alarm was going off. Somewhere. I grunted, grabbed the other pillow and pitched it toward the noise. Something crashed to the floor. I bolted upright to find I'd knocked, not only my cell off the dresser but everything else too. Damn it. I flopped back down and rubbed the sleep from my eyes. You shouldn't have stayed up so late. I squinted one eye open to find Frankie sitting on the nightstand to my right. I was busy. Yes trying to lift the curse from a demi who quite frankly doesn't deserve it. You didn't talk to him. I tugged the blankets up over my head. And you did? What happened to, we'll never bring a demi around again. Ever. No matter what, because they're all the same. I burrowed deeper under the covers, and willed Frankie to shut up. He didn't, prattling on and on about my failed relationships. I finally had enough and threw the covers off, then climbed out of bed. For the record, I'm not dating him. I snatched my sweatshirt from the floor and tugged it over my head. Helping him, that's it. For now. What's that supposed to mean? I pulled back my hair in a messy bun. It means the last three guys you were just helping, you ended up dating and then look at what happened. They all left you because they're idiots who don't deserve you. As much as I hated to admit it, Frankie was right. The longest relationship I ever had was three months. He'd been a witch from my coven, and he knew who I was. Or I thought he did. He took one look at my place and thought I'd gone off the deep end, studying plants which he found useless. Then he would constantly remind me that I was the daughter of one of the greatest witches of our time. I should be able to do anything, and I was holding myself back. No matter how many times I told him I couldn't do something, he'd accuse me of lying. The ones before him just liked me because they could claim they were better at magic than me. Then there were the Demis I dated. They were all a joke. Half of them were like Finnick. They didn't care about feelings or relationships. They just took what they wanted then went on their way. Look, it'll be fine. This could be a good thing for me, I told Frankie. How? If I can remove the curse placed on him by Karina, then the elders and my mother have to admit that there's potential in me. They have to let me keep my magic. Please tell me you're going to wait to tell Harriet until you're successful, he pleaded as I searched for my pants and boots. Beckett, you're not answering me, and that makes me worried. Look, from the tea leaves I read last night, I said, pausing long enough to drag my leather pants up my legs and then sit on the floor to work on my boots. The curse is complex but not impossible for someone other than the caster to break. Then you know what curse she used? I wavered my hand back and forth. It's a variation of a common one. She's tied it to his god side, which I'll admit I've never heard of before. That does complicate it, I murmured more to myself than Frankie now. I'll just reverse the effects of what she did. I don't know the exact words, but I'm sure I can find them with a bit of research. I do have a few contacts in Karina's coven. I should have all the ingredients here. Hum, maybe not. The moonflower hasn't blossomed yet, that'll take time, what? I asked, when I turned to find Frankie had migrated to my feet. You sound crazy. You're messing with dark magic. I'm undoing dark magic. That's different. Different, but still dangerous. Beckett, I'm supposed to be your voice of reason, right? Please listen to me now. Wait to tell your mom. And I hate to say it, but you might end up needing her help. My hands froze in lacing up my boots. Did you seriously just say that to me? Frankie's eyes stretched as far as they could, and then he was laughing. Gods no. Do you think I'm stupid? Harriet's a pain in the ass. You can't go to her for help, but you might need someone. You haven't messed with dark magic much. I'm just removing a curse. And you know what? My mother doesn't even have to know that much. What are you going to tell her then? I made sure I looked mostly presentable, 
then hurried down the spiral steps to the main floor of my loft. I am going to simply tell her I'm working on something big and magical, and that I need time to prove I deserve to keep my magic. She'll want details. I'll convince her she doesn't need them. I check the calendar above my work table, not the mortal calendar, but the witch one. Today was a day of rituals. Ones that were performed in late October in preparation for All Hallows' Eve, when the veil between the world of the living and the dead was thin. My mother would be at the coven house for the next two weeks, at least. With any luck, I'd get there early enough to speak with her alone. I told Frankie I'd stop by on my way to work, then hurried to the rooftop. I'd left my truck parked at Rose's, and didn't want to waste time going to get it since I'd be at work later anyway. I removed the small black broom figurine from my sweatshirt pocket, and set it on top of the roof. The morning was foggy. I'd be able to get into the clouds easily enough without being seen. First time's the charm, I told myself and held out my hand to my broom. The spell was simple enough, but most of the time when I tried it my broom liked to catch fire. It hadn't always been black. My first attempt fizzled, and I was left with nothing but static electricity shooting from one finger to the next. Shaking out my sparking hands I tried a second time. Bubbles appeared this time. For some reason Finnick came to mind. I pushed the thought of him away and tried again. A loud pop sounded. I opened my eyes to find my broom waiting for me, full size and hovering about three feet off the rooftop. Would you look at that, I mused to myself as I ran my hand over the broom. I didn't ponder long on why the spell seemed to work perfectly the second I thought of Finnick. I was just going to believe this was one of those few times I was able to pull off a spell without it completely failing. Or setting something on fire. I climbed atop the broom and pushed off into the sky. It was cold, but my broom had a shield that protected me from the elements. Water streaked around me as I zoomed through the sky, toward the coven house located outside the city. The mansion, because that's what it was, sat behind a stone wall and a set of iron gates. Tourists thought it was the home of some weird cult, but could never figure out exactly for what. The coven had worked for years to spread the story that an elderly group of women lived there together, all rich and widows. No one was buying it though, so they gave up. As I neared the wall, I lowered the shield around my broom so the protection spells cast around the mansion wouldn't knock me off. There was no visible barrier, but a heavy dose of magic guarded this place. It made my hair stand on end the moment I passed through it. After touching down on the front lawn, I shrank my broom back down to size and hurried out of the light rain that had begun. Two men dressed in impeccable gray suits opened the front doors. No one else was on the grounds this dreary morning. Most would be busy, helping with the rituals anyway. I walked to the large ornately carved wooden desk in the foyer to the right, and smiled at the witch sitting there. Name, he asked. Beckett Jenkins. Is Harriet busy? They haven't started the rituals yet, he said as he skimmed over the pages on his desk. You're just in time. Think she's with Benjamin, in the preparation chamber. Great. Thanks, Todd. The mansion was far larger on the inside than it appeared on the outside. The main chamber for rituals was set at the heart of the building, which in turn had been built over a very ancient source of magic. It was one of the reasons many witches stayed at the mansion for extended periods of time. Being here gave their magic a boost. Well, most of them. Did nothing for me, except make my mistakes a hundred times worse. Tapestries and paintings of witches covered every available spot as I made my way around the circular hall that wrapped around the main chamber. A set of red double doors with a sign above it saying, Preparation Chamber, met me once I was near the southern end. I knocked once, then waited. Enter, my mother called, and I blew out a shaky breath. I could do this. I was going to march in there and demand that she and the elders give me more time. If my father was with her, he might be able to back me up and convince her I deserve this chance. I squared my shoulders and marched inside. I need to talk to, oh uh, hi everyone, I mumbled and gave a half wave. Not only were my parents here, but the elders too. All of them. 
They were in various stages of putting on dark orange robes, but everyone stopped to stare at my entrance. Beckett, what is it? We don't have all day, my mother said brusquely. Guest, she was still aggravated at how I left our last conversation. Right, uh, can we go somewhere a bit more private? She sighed. No, we can't. We're only a few minutes away from starting. Her eyes took in what I was wearing, and her lips thinned. I hope it's dire if you came here dressed like that. Honestly, Beckett. It is important. I reminded myself of what was at stake. I know that you all have come to a decision about me and my magic, but I'm working on something big. Something big and magical that's going to make you change your minds about me. My mother's brow rose. And what might that be? I don't want to tell you and ruin the surprise, I said, and she shook her head. Just hear me out. If you give me this chance and I fail again, then I'll willingly. I stopped, took a deep breath, and fought the urge to be sick. I'll willingly let you bind my magic. Permanently. But if what I'm doing works, then you have to let me keep my magic. No more trying to make me give it up. Deal. My mother glanced around the room at the elders. One by one they bowed and I held my breath. My father gave me a thumbs up behind my mother's back. Agreed. How much time do you require? My mother said. A month. Sixteen days, she said, and my stomach plummeted. You have sixteen days to prove to us your magic is worth preserving. Is there anything else? Nope, ah, uh, that was it. Thank you all for your time. I guess I'll be going now. I slipped out of the room as quickly as I could and leaned against the wall. My father followed me out and hugged me. Why is she like that? I whispered when he pulled away. She's always been very disciplined and a bit intense. You know that. He tucked a curl behind my ears. I am glad you turned out more like me, though. Be nice if my magic worked as well as yours. He chuckled warmly. You've got this, kiddo. I know you do. I don't agree with what they want to do, but they won't listen to me. Quite a few of them are worried about what kind of power you've got that they don't know about. Why don't they do something else then? He smiled sadly. I don't know. If I had any voice in this coven, you know I'd put a stop to this. Sadly, I'm just a lowly member like you. Care to tell me what you're working on? Nah, I don't want to get anyone's hopes up. I loved my father, but times like this were when I needed him to step up and be a father. My mother had him too tightly wrapped around her finger. She always would. I should get back. Got a lot of work to do. He gave me one last hug, told me to stop by one night then let me go. The rain was cold as I climbed back onto my broom and headed for home. Rose laughed throughout my retelling of Phoenix coming into the bookstore. She'd spit tea out of when I got to the part about accidentally turning him pink with purple spots. She was still laughing, and tell the part where we ended up tangled on the floor together in my loft. Then she stopped so suddenly, I worried she'd had a heart attack. Rose? I waved a hand in front of her face. She playfully swatted it away. You agreed to help him then? I did. He looked so lost and I, uh, I think I can use his predicament to my advantage. And how are you going to do that? I sorted a few more books onto the shelf. Easy, really. I just have to prove I can use my magic by removing his curse. Shouldn't be an issue. You said it was a curse placed on him by a dark witch. I've read about dark magic all my life. It's nothing I can't handle. Rose took hold of my arm and gave me a stern look. Beckett, are you about to be way in over your head? You're supposed to be figuring out what's wrong with your magic, not trying to save some demi. No matter how attracted to him you might be. My cheeks grew hot. Granted he is pretty handsome for a demi, but that has nothing to do with it. I'm helping him, because this is my chance to prove I'm worth something to my mother and the coven. I slammed the rest of the books onto the shelf and stormed away. I didn't get very far. I spun back around and hung my head. Sorry Rose, I'm just stressed about all this binding shit. I can't lose my powers. 
I don't want to, and it's not fair. Rose smiled as she exited the stacks and placed her hands on my shoulders. Life's not fair. Yeah, I know, but this is my entire world about to be flipped over. Which is why you should be focusing on you and only you. This Demi can find someone else, can't he? You can't stand there and tell me you've gone through all the books I found for you. I avoided her gaze as I muttered, a few of them. Beckett, do not let your future ride on whether you can save Finnick. Please? I worry about you enough as it is. I frowned at her choice of words. Why does it sound like you're not simply worried about the magical part of my life? I looked at her harder, and this time she was the one who walked away. Oh no, you don't get to just ignore me. You think I'm going to fall for this guy and what, get my heart broken? He turns into a stinky smelly jackass. I'm not about to fall in love with him. And I just met him last night. Something I've heard from many young women over the years. I scoffed, then returned to the shelves and the stack of books I was supposed to be working on. I'm not going to fall for him. I'm going to remove the curse. That's it. Aha. What color are his eyes? I shoved another book onto the shelf harder than necessary and knocked about ten off. They thudded around my feet, and I rested my forehead against the shelf. I don't remember. You're lying, she sang as she walked by and returned to the stacks behind me. I don't remember, I repeated louder, but in reality I did. They were green but not just one shade of green. They shifted like the tide, flowing from one variation to the next. They started as a deep forest green, then went to jade, and settled on a light green that reminded me of mist over green pastures. But they weren't always green. They drifted through varying shades of blue like the ocean, before they returned to green. I repeated those words in my head, and jerked myself away from the shelf. Can I just get back to work? I said in a rush as my heart pounded. Why was I suddenly nervous? You know I'm only looking out for you. I rolled my eyes as I picked up the books I dropped. I felt that eye roll, Rose called. And you do know what color his eyes are. So what if I do? I whispered. When I straightened, I yelped in surprise to find Rose standing right there, arms crossed. Do not fall for this, Demi. I don't want to have to pick up the pieces again. Rose was usually the person I turned to when my relationships failed. She'd been there with me through them all. And when I say all, I mean all of them. I'd never really loved any of them, but the worry in her eyes said one of these days she was terrified I would be in love. That I'd get my heart ripped out and stomped on. Just business, I assured her. Better be, or I'm going to shove my boot so far up his ass you'll need to use magic to remove it. She winked as I laughed at the image that popped into my head. He's stopping by tonight after work, I told Rose, not sure why I said it. Do I need to chaperone you too? That's it, no more gossip for you. None. The rest of the day passed, as we bantered back and forth like usually did. There was a steady stream of customers in the afternoon, that broke up any chance Rose had to give me more trouble over Finnick. I went about my job, my mind wandering to a pair of smiling green eyes. To that messy blonde hair of his, and the way he very pathetically flirted get me to help him. If Finnick had never been cursed, I never would have met him. He wasn't exactly my type, and from what I'd heard of his past relationships with other witches, I was nothing like what he was usually after. He'd come over tonight and remind me that I wouldn't have a chance with a guy like him anyway. Rose had nothing to worry about. Chapter 6 Beckett Two days had gone by. Over a cup of coffee, I glowered at the calendar. Saturday was my day off, and I planned to work on Finnick's curse the entire time. He was supposed to be swinging by this evening. Same as he had for the last couple of days. I thought I might be making headway on figuring out what Karina had used to form the base of the curse. But I was making way less headway when it came to convincing myself that Finnick was not a guy worth liking. He was the son of Dion, a notorious womanizer. He was a partier who cared more about creating drunken festivities for mortals and gods alike 
than doing anything worthwhile. Finnick had stopped the fake flirting, but there were times he said things that made me pause. Not to mention the way he watched me when I was mixing potions and crushing herbs. He was easy to talk to, which threw me off. He'd ask me a single question, and then I was telling him about growing up at the coven house, and how Harriet treated me just like one of her students instead of her daughter. I found myself ranting for an hour when I finally glanced at him to catch him watching me with an amused grin. I'd gotten annoyed and told him we were done for the day. He'd seemed put off, but agreed to leave after promising he'd be back today to help with whatever he could. Finnick the demigod was confusing the hell out of me. Just get rid of the curse, and then you can get out of this situation before it gets any stickier. Should I be worried? Frankie said from next to me at the kitchen counter. Nope you should not. And stop turning into a tarantula every time he comes over. Think of him as a client. I carried my coffee to the work table and sat down on the bar chair. My notes regarding the curse were spread across the tabletop. I needed more information about the curse. I was flipping through another one of the spell books I'd acquired over the years when a knock came at my door. Come on in. It's open, I called, not turning away from the recipe in front of me. The door opened, and my shadow swooned on the wall in front of me. I ignored its dramatics and turned around to greet Finnick. He had a paper sack with him, which he set on the kitchen counter. What's all that? I asked curiously. My way of apologizing for, well, I'm not exactly sure what but you seemed upset last night. And your kitchen seems lacking in groceries, which tells me you probably don't eat as much as you should, so I'm going to make food while we work. He pulled out eggs, bacon, hash browns, chocolate milk and more food. You do what you want. I hid my grin behind my coffee. But I did find a potion for you to try today. Will it get rid of the curse? He asked eagerly. No, not exactly, but if it works, it should help delay the effects. Finnick had told me the last night his time spent as a jackass was getting longer. He'd been testing it twice a day, even though I told him that was probably not a good idea. The more he used his powers, the worse the curse would become. If he used his powers too much, there was a slim chance he'd be stuck as a jackass forever. He'd muttered something about being fine with that if he could be a jackass with powers. As I spent time with Finnick, which was turning out to be quite a bit of time, the more I noticed his frayed edges. He was not as perfect or as arrogant as I first believed. The logical side of me said I was looking for a reason to find him different than the other Demis. The rest of me said he was trying to hide something from the world. Pain or grief. Maybe anger. There was definitely something there, bubbling under the surface. I shook myself out of my deep thoughts and set to work brewing the potion while the scent of frying bacon filled my loft. I breathed it in, my mouth watering and my stomach growling. He might have a point. I didn't eat as often as I should. I was behind on filling current orders for ingredients as it was. I'd sleep for a month if I resolved Finnick's curse and didn't have my powers bound. Without a word he brought me a plate and nudged it closer and closer until I gave in and ate. He asked me about the flowers growing around my place, and I told him about them. An hour later, I could have kicked myself. I'd done it again. Your trouble, I said without thinking. He took the dirty dishes to the sink and started washing them. Why do you say that? Are you sure you're not using magic on me? He laughed and shrugged. You tell me. What's this magic I'm supposedly casting on you? You're too damned easy to talk to. And that's a bad thing? No. I mean maybe. I'm not sure yet, but you definitely don't need to hear me rant about my mother or the coven or just, never mind. Let's focus on the curse. Afraid I'll get to know you? And maybe like it? I stopped stirring the bubbling blue potion in the cauldron. Scared that you won't, I heard myself say and wished I could take it back. At the sink, the water shut off. I glanced over my shoulder to see those green eyes watching me intently. He had the dish towel casually thrown over his shoulder as he leaned against the counter. Goddess, why did he have to look so handsome? 
Wiping my now sweaty palms on my jeans, I scooped a ladle of the potion out of the cauldron and poured it carefully into a cup. Here, drink this. I held it out to him when I reached the kitchen. Cheers, he said, then drank it down. Smacking his lips, he set the cup on the counter. Well? I watched for any sign of side effects, but his nails didn't fall out and his hair remained blonde. It didn't turn gray, and no wrinkles appeared on his face. Good. Should give us some more time to figure out this curse. I'm just going to be doing some more reading, for a while. If you have anything you wanted to do today, feel free to come back later. I think I'll hang out here if you don't mind. You need me to do anything for you. Take care of your plants or I don't know, read something for you. I guess you can take care of the plants. I have a list of what needs what. Over there by the desk. I followed him as he went to the list, and then grabbed the large metal watering can from the metal shelves and filled it. Was he doing this to win me over, or because he likes spending time with me? Rose's words of warning came back. Thankfully, Finnick didn't seem to notice my internal dilemma, and I settled back at the work table for some heavy reading. Frankie talked to Finnick and helped him see to the care of my numerous plants. The sounds of their working and talking made a nice background soundtrack comforting me. I stretched my neck and sighed after a while. A few hours had passed and Finnick was still here. He was pruning the snake eye blossoms when our eyes met. I quickly looked away. I chanced another glance to find him watching me. Help you with something? I asked. You know you do this thing when you're working. With your tongue. No, I don't, I said with an embarrassed laugh. Okay, whatever you say. He walked away from the plant and came toward me. It's adorable, by the way. I fought the urge to grin. Don't think I've been called adorable before. And I thought we said no to the fake flirting. I'm already helping you. Who said it was fake? My pulse ratcheted up a few more notches, and I shut the book I'd been reading. My eyes needed a break. We both know I'm not your type, so can we not play this game? You don't trust Demis very much, do you? Or is it all guys? You tell me, since you seem to know exactly who I am. I could do that, but I like hearing you talk. He passed by the other work table, and his expression turned quizzical. Is this all about my curse, too? Were my powers bound? I shot out of my chair and rushed to cover up the research I'd been doing on myself. No, that's for something else. Care to share? I shoved my messy hair out of my face and chewed my bottom lip. My magic, I think there's a chance something's messing me up. Like a block or... I don't know. A curse, he asked. Maybe. I just am. All right, I wasn't going to tell you this, but since I can't seem to keep my mouth shut around you, I think there's a chance I'm not messed up. Someone did something to me to make me this way. I'm trying to figure out if there's a chance to undo some type of unknown binding on my magic. He peered around me at my handwritten notes. I'm not a witch, but these spells seem pretty complex. You're not planning on trying these out alone, are you? No, of course not, that would be irresponsible. Yes, is what I wanted to say. I was planning on trying out all of them on myself in hopes one of them would work, and my magic would be released. Then I could show my mother and the rest of the elders that I was a true witch. Just getting things ready, that's all. Those green eyes weren't convinced but he dropped it. You know, you haven't told me much about yourself yet. His face darkened and he pulled away. Not much to tell. Son of Dion and a mortal. God of parties, booze and good times, he said with a bitter laugh. Not much else to tell. Not like I've done anything useful, help save lives or heal people's souls or anything. He rested his hands on the counter, then pushed away from it. Do you need me any more today? I just remembered, I had to meet up with someone. No, you can go. I'll text you if I find anything. I tried and probably failed at hiding my disappointment as he hurried for the front door. I expected him to walk out and close it behind him without a backward look. Only he didn't. He stopped with his hand on the knob and smiled. There's takeout in the fridge for later if you get hungry. 
and I'm not sure I thanked you yet, but thanks Beckett. See you tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. And you're welcome. Then he was gone, and I fell over the back of the brown overstuffed couch to lay on the cushions. My arm draped over my face, and a very large snail cleared his throat from the coffee table. What? I grumbled. You are smitten with that demi. No I'm not, I argued. You are, and honestly Beckett, I think he might be smitten with you too. I kept my arm over my face but smiled. I'd let myself enjoy the daydream for a while, until I was forced back to reality. There wasn't a world where Finnick and I could work. Besides, he'd figure out soon enough that I was a failure when he was still cursed, and my magic was bound. Then he'd hate me. I grabbed one of the throw pillows and dragged it over my face. I'd hate me. How did I end up in such a mess? Chapter 7 Finnick Loud banging on the door to my apartment had me grumbling and shuffling my feet to go answer it. Garth stood on the other side, bearing a tray of coffees and a bag from the coffee shop around the corner. He held them up, and I let him inside. You look like shit man, he said once we were in the kitchen. He slid one of the paper cups to me, and I removed the lid to let the coffee cool. Haven't seen you since the graveyard. There are some rumors going around about you. Yeah, and they're probably all true. I hadn't told anyone about being cursed, except the witches I went to for help. Figured they'd spread the news since they all despised me for how I've acted over the years. Since meeting Beckett, working with her, well, being yelled at by her really, I saw how much of an ass I let myself become. How much I acted like Dion. It pissed me off, and I'd been fighting with myself the last few days to prove I wasn't that bad of a guy. I was failing that fight. I hardly slept, and the only time I didn't feel like shit was when I was around Beckett. Listening to her talk, and man could she talk, helped remove me from my own problems. Listening to her rant while she worked fascinated me. Everything about that witch drew me in. Now I was left wondering if I was falling for her because of who she was, or because that's just what I did. I found witches, got what I wanted, and then left them in the dust. Because love didn't exist. I took a gulp of coffee without thinking, and burned my tongue. Are you contemplating the meaning of the universe over there, or what? Garth asked. Talk to me, Finnick. What's going on with you? I was cursed by Karina, I said, and set the coffee aside to run my hands through my messed up hair. Not much to tell after that. When I use my powers, I turn into a jackass. Garth didn't laugh. My other so-called friends would have been rolling on the floor by now. Not Garth. Probably the only reason I liked him. That's a bit harsh, and what, because you didn't love her back? Something like that. I shouldn't have laughed in her face when she said it, but a curse. You sure she's not after something else? I took one of the breakfast sandwiches he brought and unwrapped it. What do you mean? I asked in between bites. I mean she's part of that damn blood coven, or whatever. They're into some dark shit. Always hated the gods. This curse, it's not stealing your power somehow, is it? Not that I know of. Beckett hadn't said anything about my powers being sapped by the curse. She would have let me know by now, I think. Then again, Beckett wasn't exactly the most powerful witch in the world. She was smart, though. How Harriet wasn't proud of her daughter baffled me. Beckett created new plants in her loft. The remedies she'd shown me over the last week were incredible. I stopped eating and looked out the windows as the cold rain pattered against the glass. I pictured Beckett, already hard at work, standing over the cauldron in the hearth as her hair fell into her face. She'd shove it aside, humming happily to herself. Frankie would be on the mantel, or at one of the tables, and her shadow dancing across the floor. I'd been around magic all my life, powerful, insane magic of the gods. Beckett's magic had a different feel to it, like it was the scent of fresh-baked cookies welcoming me home. Reminded me of when my mother had sane moments. I smiled remembering Beckett's laugh, her aggravated tone, the way she nibbled on her tongue while her brow crinkled in deep thought. 
Oh, man, Garth said suddenly, jerking me from my daydreaming. What? Who is she? I scoffed and finished my sandwich. Garth continued to stare at me like I'd grown a second head. Will you knock it off? There's no one. I just have a lot going on right now. Yeah, I'd say so. After all the years we've known each other, I've never seen you go all dreamy. You're thinking about a girl. Who is she? I'm thinking about the witch who's helping me remove the curse, I said. Garth clapped his hands with an excited laugh. No, just stop. It's not like that. She agreed to help me, that's all. We've been working together. Aha. Uh -huh. Whatever. Think whatever you want. All I'm saying is, you've got that look in your eyes. You almost look happy. I'm always happy. I'm the demigod of celebrations. Maybe, but you've never been happy. You and I both know the real reason you find a new girl every other week. They might think it's because you're being a, well, a jackass, he said, his lips curling with a hint of a grin. But you and I both know the real reason. I crumpled up the wrapper from the sandwich and tossed it in the bin. I worked my jaw and silently begged for him not to ask me about my mother. How's your mother? He clearly wasn't reading my vibes very well today. Dunno. Haven't been by to see her. In how long? Gillis said I should take a break, I told him. The last couple of visits have been rough, really rough. It's not like she'll know if I'm not there for a week or so. I'm sorry. I thought she was doing okay. She was, but now I hardly get five minutes with her before she loses it. Every day, I pass the asylum and talk myself out of going inside. I need Beckett to help me remove this curse so I can help my mother. You're still thinking of going through with your plans. I am, and to do that, I need my power restored. Once the curse is gone, I won't have anything to do with Beckett. Garth pursed his lips and avoided my eyes. Sure, whatever you think is best. I'm telling you, there's nothing between us. Yeah, and that's a load of bullshit. You like her, just admit it. What's the point? Love isn't real. He shook his head sadly. Go look at your reflection and say that. Out loud. Then add that you do not have feelings for this witch. What's her name anyway? Beckett. His eyes bulged. Beckett, as in Beckett Jenkins. Daughter of Harriet Jenkins, yeah, that'd be her. You really know how to pick them. Meaning what? As much as you might feel for this witch, isn't her magic sort of messed up? She's not even really part of her coven. I hear that's why she's always tucked away in her place, kind of a hermit sort of lifestyle. I pictured Beckett's leather pants, which were starting to drive me crazy when I was near her, the laced-up leather boots, the tattoos on her arms, the one at the back of her neck of a skull with flowers growing around it and the piercings that filled her right ear. She doesn't look like a hermit and certainly doesn't act like the crazy people out in the woods. Does she like you back? That's up for debate, not that it matters. Once the curse is lifted, I'll be back to working on my plans to make Dion pay. There won't be time or room for anything else, which is fine, I said, my voice growing louder, because love isn't real. Certainly not this damn fast anyway. Catching you off guard a bit. He waggled his eyebrows. I almost said yeah, but bit back the word. I have shit to do today. I'm sure you do too. Thanks for breakfast, but as you can see, I'm alive and well. Stop fooling yourself, he said as I guided him toward the front door. I'm not, but thanks for the advice. I'll call you later or something. Finnick. He tried again and grabbed the door to stop me from closing it on his face. I hope she's able to help you in more ways than one. But you have to let her in. By Garth, I snapped, and this time shut the door and locked it. I waited until he was gone, then grabbed the coffee cup from my kitchen and went to get dressed. I had a list of duties to complete before I could make my way to Beckett's. She was off today. Something about the owner of the bookstore being sick and not wanting Beckett to catch it. The reason didn't matter to me. 
just meant I got to spend more time with the witch that was quickly driving me to question everything I thought I knew. As I stood in front of the bathroom mirror, I glanced over my shoulder as if Garth was suddenly going to be there. Then I let out a shaky breath and locked eyes with my reflection. You feel nothing for Beckett because love isn't real. My eye twitched and my hands curled into fists at my sides. Damn Garth for being right. No other witch or demi or goddess made me this unsteady and so calm at the same time. I was in trouble, big trouble, and the only way out of it was to get the curse removed and disappear. Beckett might end up hating me, but if I gave in, then I'd be vulnerable or I'd hurt her worse down the road. I wouldn't do that, not to her. There was no trusting myself, not with Dion's blood running through my veins. By early afternoon, I was finished with running errands for the gods, so I stopped by a local diner to grab lunch for Beckett. She had a bad habit of not eating. There was hardly any food in her place, except coffee and the occasional takeout leftover. And a rather large container of chocolate chips. As I picked up the bags of food, I thought of the day I asked her about those. All she said was they were there in case of emergency, whatever that meant. My earlier speech about sticking to business was fading the closer I came to her loft. Once I was outside her door ready to knock, I was grinning like an idiot. My hand stopped short of the door and I backed away. Business, this had to be about business. Beckett deserved a guy in her life and it sure as hell wasn't me. Not like she'd believe me anyway. Probably thought all my flirting was still fake as she called it. The thought hurt more than it should have. I was about to knock when a loud explosion came from inside the loft. The whole building shook. I burst through the door. Beckett. I coughed, dropping the food so I could cover my face. Heavy black acrid smoke filled the loft. How were the smoke detectors not going off? Beckett. She's over here, Frankie answered. I followed his voice, knocking into tables and the couch on the way. I spotted Beckett, lying on the floor. Her hands were charred. Smoke billowed out of the cauldron. I rushed for the extinguisher in the kitchen and ran back to the cauldron, smothering the small fire and quelling the smoke. As it cleared, I sank to my knees beside Beckett and rolled her to her back, then gently pulled her into my arms. Beckett, wake up. I tapped her cheek as I studied her burnt hands. Shit, what was she trying to do? A pang of guilt shot through my chest, wondering if this was part of trying to remove my curse. Why hadn't she waited for me? Frankie appeared on Beckett's chest. She was working on a potion to try on herself, he snapped. I told her to wait, that it was dangerous, but she's hard-headed just like her mother. His shell began to pulse with a white glowing light that radiated throughout Beckett's body. Her veins lit up, and then her eyes popped open as she gasped. Easy, easy, I told her as she sank back. I've got you. You're fine. The fire's out. Fire. What fire? She tilted her head, squinting. Finnick. When did you get here? Just now. What were you thinking, trying that shit alone? I scolded. I told you I'd be here with you in case something went wrong. She waved away my words. I didn't want to bother you. And see, I'm all right. Your hands are scorched, I muttered. She held them up to check them out, but they'd healed when Frankie roused her. Not anymore, though. You two worry about nothing. She grabbed the large snail from her chest and gently set him aside. And it wasn't a spell, just a potion. Must have read the recipe wrong. You think? You almost blew up your loft. But I didn't. She sat up and I helped her when she seemed a bit woozy. Man, that was a rush. I'll have to dump out the bad batch and make a new one. She tried to get up, but I stopped her. Finnick, really, I'm all right. No worse for wear. We have work to do. How about you take a day off? Her face paled and she shook her head so hard I wondered if it gave her a headache. Nope, no time, can't do that. Time. You said the potion you gave me the other day would slow down the curse. Ah, yes. For you. We still can't waste time. 
She attempted to get up a second time, but I kept a firm hold of her hand. She sighed heavily and rolled her eyes. You're overreacting. Don't you want to stop turning into a jackass? Yeah, but not at the expense of your hands, or I don't know your life. Drama queen, she murmured. Can we at least get off the floor? I probably was overreacting for someone that was supposed to simply be here for business. The strong scent of thyme and the sweet lingering smell of one of her many lilies hung in her hair. She was warm against my chest, and the urge to hug her to see if she'd hug me back had me suddenly helping her stand. She shoved her hair out of her face and peered into the cauldron. Damn. Burned a hole right through the bottom. And you were going to drink that? I asked alarmed. Well, if I mixed it right, it wouldn't have done that. She sniffed and frowned. Did you bring burgers and fries? This woman continued to amaze me. How could she smell that through the smoke? I'd forgotten about the food. I turned to find the bags right where I'd left them. Near the front door. Yeah, figured you'd need to eat. Great, you get the food and I'll start working on this potion again. Nope, not happening. You need a day off. We both do. You're going to sit down and eat something and not go near whatever other crazy potions and spells you've found to try on yourself. I crossed my arms and stared her down. She narrowed her eyes at me. A violet glow surrounded her hand, and then she let out an aggravated yell. I wasn't sure what she was going for, but I doubted it was bubbles. Again. I smirked, and she muttered some curses then tried to storm away as the bubbles lazily sank to the floor and popped around us. Food first, I said, and caught her hand. She frowned down at the hands clasped between us. I ran my thumb gently over her knuckles, the motion feeling so natural it rooted me to the floor. I took a step closer, then another, until there was hardly any space between us. Her breath caught, and she blinked rapidly but remained right where she was. Apprehension looked back at me in those stormy gray eyes. Right along with it was desire. Her pulse quickened, thudding against my wrist through hers. I lowered my head slowly, giving her every chance to stop us from doing something we'd both probably regret. But she didn't, and then my lips were on hers. When she kissed me back, I wrapped one arm around her waist and pulled her against my chest. She stood on her toes, and then her hand was at my neck, bringing me as close as she could. The simple brush of my lips against hers turned into something far more intense, which had us both breathing hard. When her hand slid under my t-shirt, mine fisted in her black sweater and I was quickly lost in the mounting tension in the loft. Just as fast as it started, though, she drew back and put space between us. Wow, uh, it's a bit, it's a bit hot in here, isn't it? She fanned herself with her hands and smiled nervously. The blush on her cheeks made her even more attractive. I think, I think I'm going to go get that spare cauldron now. No, you are not working today. Listen, sunshine, you might be a damned fine kisser and be handsome, and have a very warm body that I'd like to curl up against for the rest of the day. She smacked a palm to her forehead. Okay, I'm going to blame all that one the explosion. Anyway, we need to keep going with removing your curse and taking care of my situation. No time to rest. I hurried around her and blocked her path to the closet under the steps. You need to take a break. Why are you so worried about time all of a sudden? She wrung her hands and bounced on the balls of her feet, two habits she did when she was worried about something or thinking way too hard. Beckett, just tell me. Did you figure something out about the curse? What? No, you've got time. It's me who doesn't. I glanced at Frankie Still, who was sitting on the floor. He wasn't looking at me, though. If a snail could scowl, I was fairly certain that's what he was doing. Scowling at Beckett. What do you mean, you don't have time? I haven't been completely honest with you, she admitted and threw her hands to the side. I'm on a time frame because Harriet Jenkins, in her infinite wisdom, has convinced the elders that my powers need to be bound permanently so I don't pose a problem down the road. They think I'm dangerous and that I'm going to self-combust or something, and they have to stop it before it happens. To protect the magical world and all that shit. 
I had 16 days to prove that my magic was useful, and I was, ah, uh, maybe possibly using your curse as my way to prove that. We're down to 10 days, and if I can't figure out what's wonky with my magic and remove your curse by then, I'm screwed. She sucked in a breath at the end of her rambling, and sank to the bottom step of the spiraled stairway. It's hopeless. I'm sorry I dragged you into this mess. I should have turned you away that night. I took a moment to process everything she just said. You're telling me your own mother wants to bind your magic. Yep. Have you hurt anyone? No, but you've seen my magic. It's not exactly reliable. And I did this to myself, she said as she held up the lock of white hair. I used to dye it to keep anyone from knowing. Sometimes I still do. Anyway, you saw me nearly blow up my place today. No, that wasn't you. That was misreading, a recipe. Beckett, you can't let them do this. She swiped at her eyes and shrugged. It's not that I want to lose my magic, but I can't stop them. There's nothing I can do. Yes, there is. You can remove the curse. She hung her head for a few long seconds. When she finally lifted it, there were tears of frustration shining in her eyes. You don't know that. Hell, I don't even know if I can. I mean, I think I know how to do it, but honestly, it's going to take a huge amount of power. Even if I can pull it off, whatever's wrong with me, if there's something magically wrong with me, it might backfire. I could hurt you. Or yourself. She didn't seem to care too much about her own safety. Won't matter much if I don't have my magic. Look, I said as I walked over and sat down on the floor in front of her, you are not powerless, not yet. Why don't I take over the research for your issue, and you just focus on the curse? If we can solve one riddle, then hopefully, we'll get the answer to the second right. How can you be so optimistic right now? It's a gift. Aha, more of your godliness, I guess. She smiled, then wiped her eyes. Can you read the old witch languages? I screwed my mouth to the side and mumbled, I'm sure I can figure it out. This shouldn't be your problem. Well, I'm making it my problem. You're the one that said I never did anything good, right? What I didn't tell her was that if she did manage to lift this curse in time, I had a feeling whatever was wrong with her magic, I could figure out and fix it with my god skills. If I couldn't, then I might be able to call in a favor. Beckett was not going to lose her magic. Since the moment we met, I sensed there was a deep well of power inside her, fighting for a way out. Her hunch about something blocking her magic was dead on. She cringed at my words. Yeah, I might have just been ticked off that night. Sorry. No, you had a point. I rubbed the back of my neck, then suddenly found it hard to find the right words. I haven't exactly been a good guy over the years, and I know I've sort of flitted from one fling to the next, but I've been going through some stuff. Stuff, huh? She teased. Yeah, stuff. I don't like to talk about it with anyone, but having parties and dates, being with other people helps distract me, makes me forget for a little while that my life's not so perfect. I thought I sensed some pain in you. Garth was the only person I ever confided in. As much as Beckett had told me, I wanted to spill my guts to her right then and there. I wanted her to know everything I was going through, but the words wouldn't come. My mother and Dion were my problems, not hers. She had enough to deal with. Letting Beckett in would just end up hurting us both. Of that, I was damn sure. Even still, I found myself leaning into her hand and thinking about the kiss we shared. Are you saying I'm not just another distraction from this stuff? She asked and edged to her words. She'd been hurt before. Her intense gaze was silently asking if I was going to be the next guy that hurt her. I'm saying I don't know, I replied honestly. Then I wanted to kick myself for it. Her hand fell away and she drew back. You know we've both just been spending so much time together. The tension and the stress does funny things to people and emotions. Maybe ah, uh, maybe we should take a break. Just a day or two away from each other. Give me a chance to clean up the mess here and refocus on your curse. Her words stung more than I was prepared for. I stood. 
I'll see you in a couple of days then. On my way to the door, I picked up the food and set it on the counter. Make sure you eat that before it gets cold. Finnick, she called when I reached the front door. Yeah. When I looked over my shoulder, she was standing there, wringing her hands and bouncing on the balls of her feet. Thanks for the food. From the way her face fell, I could tell that wasn't what she wanted to say. Sure as hell wasn't what I wanted to hear. Then again, I had no idea what I hoped for. Gods, I was turning into a romantic sap. What was wrong with me? You're welcome. Don't try anything without me. I opened the door and swiftly closed it behind me, before I could do or say anything. My mind a mess, I reached the elevator and hit the down button. I'd kiss Beckett. I'd gone in there today telling myself to stick to business, but instead I kissed her. Here, I thought I was confused this morning, but now it was ten times worse. What was I doing to us both? The ride down to the lobby passed in a blur, and then I was out on the sidewalk. I had no idea where I was headed until I found myself standing outside the front gates of the asylum. I walked up the main path and inside. Elisa was at the front desk today. I said nothing as I signed in. Finnick. Everything all right, she asked with a pout. You didn't even say hi. Been worried about you since you canceled our date last week. Everything's fine, just a lot going on. Sorry about that, I muttered, then walked down the hall toward my mother's room. After spending so much time with Beckett, all the frivolous relationships I'd had in the past seemed like such a waste of time. I should have been looking for that one person. I should have been looking for Beckett. I reached my mother's room, but Gillis beat me to it. He greeted me with a smile. Finnick, good to see you. Been a while. Been trying to stay away, as you said. How's she doing? He clasped his hands behind his back, then nodded. Why don't we take a walk? She's out in the gardens. I followed him to the glass hallway at the rear of the building, giving us a full view of the vast gardens. My mother sat on a bench beneath a large maple tree, its leaves a deep red. She was smiling and her eyes were closed. She looks happy. Gillis stopped us. She is, but it's been a rough few days. Being outside is one of the few things that seems to calm her. Has she asked for me at all? Once, when she was lucid and remembered why she was here. It only lasted a minute or so, then she had another fit. I'm sorry, Finnick. I wish I had better news for you. Should I keep away then? Or what? Tell me what to do here. I'm going to say that is up to you. When she asked for you, she did say she wished you were doing well, but was glad you weren't there to see her in this state. As much as she wants to see you, I think she wants to protect you from what might come next. You mean her losing what last bit of sanity she has left? Gillis hung his head. Yes, I'm afraid that is the path we're on. He squeezed my shoulder. Stay strong, and if you need to talk, need anything, I'm always available. He studied me closely as he added, Are you sure there's nothing you need to talk about right now? I have some time. No, but I might take you up on that offer later. He left me alone, and I stayed in that hallway watching over my mother until an orderly came to take her back to her room. Not wanting her to see me, I walked briskly to the front of the facility, then out the front doors. I didn't stop until I was a few blocks away, then I punched the closest thing I could find. That turned out to be a brick wall, and I cursed at my bloody bruised hand. If I'd been mortal, I would have broken something. I made for home planning to spend the next couple of days drinking and convincing myself there was no possible future between me and Beckett. I had to shove aside whatever feelings I had for her and remember the end game. We both had too many issues to make a relationship work. Chapter 8 Beckett My gaze skipped to the calendar hanging on the wall, then back to the chalk circle I'd drawn on my living room floor. Six days. We were down to six freaking days, and I was no closer to removing Finnick's curse. You ready to try? The Demi himself asked, standing at the other end of the loft for his safety. Yeah, let's do this. 
I shook out my hands, rolled my head then shut my eyes. The second I did that though, all I saw was Finnick, seconds before he kissed me. The sensation of his lips against mine, and his hands at my back rushed to the forefront of my mind. A burst of power shot out of my hands. I cursed to find the loft filled with bubbles. Damn that Demi for making me so frazzled. When I glanced his way, he was smirking. At least he was until he met my eyes. Then he let his face go blank, and motioned for me to try again. With bubbles popping all around, I told myself I was alone in the loft. Might as well be, what with the way Finnick had acted since our kiss. When he came back a few days later, he'd been distant. Cold, almost. The atmosphere had changed. Then the next day, he seemed like he was fighting getting closer to me. He told me we should stick to business, and I wanted to smack him. He shouldn't be allowed to kiss a girl like that, then act as if nothing happened. He might be able to pretend the tension between us wasn't suffocating us, but it was. It practically sparked across the loft between us. As much as I wanted to hit him, I wanted to kiss him again too. I could settle for both, if only I managed to find the courage to do it. Beckett? Just give me a second, I snapped. There's a very real chance I'll mess this up and blow myself out the window or something. That's not funny. Just saying it's a possibility. Or I can catch the loft on fire, or make myself disappear or shrink or who the hell knows with me, so if you'd please just give me a second to prepare myself, that would be great. I sucked in a breath after my rant, and squinted open an eye. The freaking man was grinning, just as he always did when I rambled on and on about anything. I shut my eye and tried to focus as his gaze flicked to me. The spell for this ritual was all mental. I had the words memorized, and held my hands out to my side toward the edges of the circle. If it went according to plan, it would reveal the core of my magic and reveal if something was blocking it. If there was nothing there, then I was shit out of luck. I waited until my heart rate steadied, then recited the words inside my head. Sparks crackled at my fingertips, and a rush of warm air lifted my hair from my neck. A loud pop made me wince. I opened my eyes. Did it work? I asked, glancing around. Guys, ah, damn it. Beckett? Finnick called out. I grimaced. You all right? You're not like missing limbs or anything, are you? No, I'm fine. You just sort of disappeared. The metal steps rattled as I raced down them and double checked the spell book on the kitchen counter. Off by one syllable. All right, redo. I walked back to the center of the circle and went ahead with the second try. There was no loud pop this time, but after nothing happened either. I opened my eyes to find Finnick shaking his head. Third time's a charm, right? Two more efforts yielded nothing. Nothing. I yelled in frustration and stomped around the circle. Maybe you should take a break, Finnick suggested. No, I'm going to get this right, and I'm not stopping until I do. If you want to leave, then leave. I said I'd be here for you, and that's what I'm going to do. I laughed as I bounced on the balls of my feet to get my energy flowing. Not sure why. Not like this is for anything other than business, right? Beckett, can we talk about that later? Oh, so now you want to talk about it? I ran my hand through my hair then pointed at him. You're unbelievable. You know that? You're just like all the others. No I'm not, and you know it. Do I? You come in here, you talk to me, get to know me, you tell me you're going through this stuff and we kiss and you leave me a hot mess, and then when you finally come back you act like it's nothing. I turned my back and shut my eyes. I think it'd be better if you went. No. Someone needs to be here to watch your back. You mean clean up my mess, I corrected harshly. More like be here in case you hurt yourself. Which I'm not saying you'll do on purpose, he added in a rush. And that kiss did mean something to me. Why do I not believe you? I opened my eyes. He stood right on the other side of the circle. You should move back. Don't want to singe your perfect demi eyebrows. And I'm the difficult one. He rubbed the back of his neck. Your familiar attacked me, because you don't let yourself trust any demis. 
Hell, I bet you don't let yourself trust any guy. I fail to see what that has to do with anything. You could have confronted me days ago about our kiss, but you didn't. Almost like you don't want to talk about it, either. So you don't want to talk about it, I accused. That is not what I meant. I do, but you and I have a lot of shit going on right now. You're right. You're absolutely right. We shouldn't be thinking about kissing, or anything else with each other. Besides, you probably can't even handle a real honest relationship. He grunted, and then he stepped inside the circle. I started to warn him to go away when he wrapped his arm around my waist, pulled me against his chest and covered my mouth with his. For a split second I froze, then I was kissing him back like this was the last time I'd ever get to kiss anybody. An electric charge sparked between us. Ah uh, guys? Frankie said from somewhere behind me. I waved him away and grabbed hold of Finnick's shoulders as he deepened the kiss, making my toes curl against the hard floor. Beckett, you should really look. I ignored him completely as the static charge built. Sparks appeared between us, and just when I thought I couldn't get any warmer, the spell I'd memorized shot through my mind, followed by a loud pop. I yelped. Finnick cursed. We were thrown to the floor. Told you, Frankie said as we sat up. What the hell was that? Finnick asked, then looked at something behind me. Ah, Beckett, I think it worked. What worked a spell? I hadn't even meant to cast it. I turned around and there, hovering in the center of the circle, was a translucent outline of my body. Inside the lines was a blue and white sparkling mist, almost like I was staring into a galaxy. Dead center was a twisted core of pure violet, but it wasn't alone. Wrapped around and cutting into the magical core was a black vine covered in thorns. Finnick helped me to my feet and we walked closer. Is that a binding? I nodded slowly and reached out to the reflected image of my inner magic. It is and it's been there for years. No, not just years. I rested my hand on it and focused. I've had this in me since I was born. The words were hollow to my ears as my heart pounded in disbelief. How was this possible? How did my mother not know that someone bound my magic? The room spun, and then Finnick was there, holding me up. Easy, Beckett. Why don't you sit down? No. Whoever did this to me, their magic should have left a trace. You need to take a moment and breathe. The spell won't last that long, I argued. Just give me a minute. I reached my hand out and rested it on the black vine. The weight of just how long I'd been cursed with this damned thing strangling my magic was enough to knock me to the floor. It would have too, if Finnick hadn't held me up. The spell had been cast so long ago that the trace was faint and buried deep within the vine. I shoved my hand into the squishy surface until I reached the very center. My fingers brushed against the presence of someone else's magic, and this time I did fall over right into Finnick. Beckett? Talk to me. What's wrong? Beckett. No, I whispered, staring at my tingling fingertips in shock. No. She wouldn't. Who? Beckett, you're pale. We need to get you out of this circle. Get you some water. Harriet, I snapped. She cast the spell. Wait, Harriet, as in Harriet, your mother. The magical trace, it's hers. My hand dropped. All these years, she knew why my magic was flawed because she made me this way. She did this to me. Finnick was talking, but the words couldn't penetrate the rushing that filled my ears. Everything about my life, about my magic, and who I was as a witch was a lie. I was empty inside, hollow. There was nothing to me. No way to know what kind of magic I might have been able to achieve, all because she stopped me from having that chance. She ruined my life, and for what? My father had told me how much they'd wanted a kid. It was why they had me so quickly after they were married. Did she change her mind after I was born? Beckett. Finnick shook my shoulders gently. I took one look at him, then shoved away from his arms and stomped around my loft. Madly, I ran my hands through my hair as the remnants of the spell faded, taking the evidence of what my mother did with it. She broke me, I muttered. I know, but you need to take a breath. 
Just stop and slow down for a second. How the hell am I supposed to do that? I shouted at the top of my lungs as blind fury exploded out of me. All my life she's called me a failure and it's all her fault. Why would she do this to me? Why? No mother does this to their child unless they have a damn good reason or she didn't want me. Unless she hates me. I paced faster, replaying so many moments from my childhood, watching my mother grow more disappointed in me as the years passed and my magic failed. The moment the coven told my mother she should be happy, I was at least healthy, since my magic wasn't going to be anything exciting. The countless arguments over the years when she blamed me. Tears streamed down my face without my even realizing it. Then I was in Phoenix's arms. He held me tightly to his chest as I cried, soaking his dark blue button down. Not that he seemed to mind. When he ran his hand up and down my back to soothe me then sweetly kissed the top of my head, the dam I hadn't even realized was still in place on my emotions came tumbling down. It had first cracked when he'd rushed inside that circle and kissed me. Now, I wasn't sure why we were trying to fight this. Finnick calmed me down and made me feel safe when my world was being turned upside down and inside out. As much as I longed to kiss him again, there was something else I had to take care of. I drew back then walked away from him, hastily wiping at my face. When I scooped up my broom from my work table and grabbed my leather jacket, Finnick was right there to stop me. What are you doing? I am going to go talk to her. What the hell do you think I'm doing? Move. This is a bad idea, he argued, not letting me pass. You're pissed and I get it, believe me, I do, but you shouldn't be flying in this condition. He's right, Frankie said from the shelf behind me. Stay, Beckett. Calm down first. Calm down? I said as mad laughter bubbled up inside me. How the hell do you expect me to calm down, after learning my own flesh and blood, the woman who gave birth to me, is the reason for everything that's gone wrong? I shoved at Finnick, but he planted his feet and refused to budge. Don't make me add another curse to your load, not when I'm starting to like you. His eyes crinkled with the hint of a smile, but he shook his head. Do what you have to do, but you're not leaving. Yeah, actually, I am. I made to step to the right, and he followed, but then I dodged to the left and bolted out the door. He called after me, as I sprinted for the stairwell leading to the roof. I had my broom in hand, ready to transform when Finnick's hand covered mine and he took it from me. Give it back right now. Or what? This isn't a joke. This is my life. Yeah, I know, which is why I'm trying to stop you from ruining it any more than she already did. You need to take some time to think. That's all I'm asking. Desperation and pain overrode common sense. I lunged forward and pushed Finnick hard, sending him toward the edge of the roof. He reacted as I hoped he would when his feet slipped on the slick surface. He threw out a hand to catch himself, and on instinct used his power to stop himself from slamming into the hard stone edge of the roof. The second he righted himself with a burst of white godly power, the jackass stood in his place and my broom dropped to the roof. Have you lost your mind? Finnick bellowed, then brayed. Beckett. Don't do this. Thank you for being here, but this can't wait. In my state of unsteadiness, it took five tries until I managed to bring my broom to full size. Once it was, I hopped on and looked to Finnick. His large black eyes pleaded for me to stay. I'll be back, I promised him. We should talk about that kiss. Then I pushed off the roof, while his braying shouts followed me into the clouds. I told myself, no matter what my mother said to me, I wasn't going to cry in front of her. I'd save my tears for after, when I was drowning in my own self-pity. The whole ride to the coven house, I told myself she had a good reason for binding my magic. A life or death situation. That's the only reason I could think of for why she would cast such a heavy spell on an infant and lie about it. I landed on the lawn and sprinted to the front doors, not bothering to shrink my broom. The weather had been cool, but pleasant and witches dotted the grounds and the porch. They nodded to me as I passed, but I only had eyes for one witch. The rituals would still be taking place, which meant Harriet should be here. Todd, I asked breathlessly once I was let inside, where is she? Beckett, are you all right? 
he glanced over the desk at my feet. Where are your boots? Todd just please tell me where she is. Who? My mother. Harriet Jenkins, I corrected myself. Where is she? It's urgent. He shuffled through the papers on his desk, then tapped his finger on one. She said she would be in her private study, for the rest of the day. Beckett, wait, he called after me as I sprinted for the stairs. The elders each had their private quarters on the top floor at the coven house. I climbed three flights of stairs, hardly slowing to catch my breath or apologize to the witches I ran into. My heart broke with each step, wondering if my father knew what my mother had done to me. When I reached the wooden door with the intricately carved maple tree, I banged my fist on it. Mother? I need to talk to you. Beckett honestly, her voice came from within. The sound of a lock clicked and then the door opened. Her black hair flowed loosely over her shoulders and she wore dark violet robes. What's wrong? Are you all right? I pushed past into her study. No, I'm not freaking all right. She pursed her lips, then shut the door behind her. I see since you showed up in quite the state. Honestly, you look like you've been flying through a windstorm. Have some decency when you come to our sacred home. Look who's talking, I shot back. She tilted her head. Are you all right? I can feel your disturbed energy from here. Is this about the project you're working on? Why? Hoping I've come admitting defeat. Or are you expecting it? Why would I expect it, except for the fact that everyone knows your magic is weak and a failure, she replied harshly. She clasped her hands in front of her and arched a brow. Well? Why have you come then? I am quite busy. I paced around the room, then reached the large desk planted in front of a set of bay windows. Absently, I shuffled a few pages around, knowing it'd get on her nerves. I want to know why. Why what? she asked, exasperated. She sighed. Beckett, stop touching things that aren't yours. I should be saying the same damn thing to you, mother. You're making no sense. Fine, I'll spell it out for you then. You bound my magic when I was an infant, and I would very much like to know why, since all these years you've called me a failure. I leveled her with a glare and waited for her face to pale or for her to shake and fall apart as she confessed some big dark secret why she did it. I prayed to the goddess, she had a good reason. She nodded slowly and shrugged. My heart sank, and the air went out of my lungs. Mother? I never thought you would be strong enough to cast one of those inner reflection spells. You were wrong. Tell me, I snapped, shoving a stack of important-looking papers off her desk in my rage. Tell me why you broke me. Her laughter was harsh as she approached the desk. Broke you? You think I broke you? The binding came from you. She rested her palms flat on her desk and stared me down. You broke me, my dear sweet daughter. You destroyed my life. Don't you dare stand there and complain that I broke you. My mind raced, trying to figure out her meaning. Then you didn't want me. I did, she argued. Your father and I were desperate for a child and were overjoyed when I became pregnant with you. The elders came to us, and told me our oldest oracle had a vision. I would give birth to a witch that would carry this coven into the future. A witch with immense power. Power so great others would follow her without question, and she would reshape the coven. We were all a little wary of course, but I expected nothing less since you came from my bloodline. I don't understand. Why did you bind my power then? Were they scared of what I could do? My mother leaned away, and then she was walking slowly around the room, running her fingers over the shelves of books that had taken over the walls. No. They know nothing of what I did. I bound your powers as a test. A test which you failed. But why? If I was this witch with great power, why would you bind my magic? Nothing she said was making sense. I gripped the edge of the desk to keep myself from just sinking to the floor in despair. If you were this witch they foresaw, you would be able to break the binding even at a young age, she explained simply as if she hadn't ruined my life. Alas, you did not, and as the years went on I realized you were not the daughter they predicted. I had not had that child yet. 
She rested her hands on her stomach, and when the robes grew taut, I thought I was going to be sick. Perhaps your sister will fare better. You're pregnant? Yes, I am. She beamed, as if I was supposed to be excited to hear all of this. Well? I swallowed the lump in my throat. Well, what? Aren't you going to congratulate your mother? Most siblings show some excitement when their parents are pregnant. You get to have a sister. No, I snapped, and her smile vanished in a blink. How could you do this to me? Oh, honestly, Beckett, it was probably for the best. Do you really think it would have made a difference? I sputtered for words. Are you serious? You bound my magic as a test. I was a baby full of potential, waiting to be trained and taught. And you spurned me because I couldn't break your binding? What the hell is wrong with you? You're overreacting. No, I'm pretty sure I'm not. Remove it right now. She turned her back to me and sat in the armchair in front of her desk. And why would I do that when the elders are just going to replace it in what six days? They can't go through with it now. It's not my fault. It's yours. Yes, and you think they'll believe you over me? Come now, Beckett, simply accept your fate. You were not meant to be a great witch. Or a witch at all. You've managed to create quite a nice life for yourself. I'm not sure I see the problem. Does my father know what you did to me? I clenched my jaw as I asked, is that even his child? How dare you accuse me of infidelity? Of course it's his child. I took a shaky breath and stood in front of her. Just remove the binding. That's all I'm asking of you, and then I'll officially leave the coven on my own. Why would you do that? You are still my daughter, still of my blood. I scoffed and hung my head, knowing she'd never just do as I asked. No, I'm not. What did you say? I said I'm not your effing daughter, I yelled. And you, you should never be allowed to have more kids if you're going to treat them like experiments. Go to hell, you and your new baby. I'm done with you. Done with all of this shit. Beckett, if you don't show up to the hearing, we'll drag you there, she warned me when I was at the door. At that moment, I wanted anything to break the binding and show her just how powerful I was. But that didn't happen. Nothing did, except my coming to the harsh understanding that my mother never loved me or cared for me or gave two shits what happened to me. I flipped her off smirking when her jaw dropped. She said my name, but I was already out the door and sprinting back through the house. I made it outside and to one of the side gardens of lilies, then I was sick. I heaved and fought back the tears. What had I done to deserve this? She was pregnant with another child. Witches lived to be several hundred years old. If this baby wasn't as powerful, she would do the exact same thing to it that she did to me. She was nothing but a monster. When I straightened, several witches stood close by, watching me in disgust. I flipped them off too, then climbed atop my broom and soared into the oncoming storm clouds, half hoping I'd be struck by a bolt of lightning and be put out of my misery. Chapter 9 Finnick I searched the sky for any sign of Beckett, but there was nothing but streaks of lightning. The rain was coming soon, and the storm rolling in was not going to be a nice one. Come on, Beckett, I muttered. Where are you? I'd reverted to my human form a few minutes ago and had been pacing from one corner of the roof to the other, praying to my entire family tree that she'd make it home safe. Five more minutes passed than ten. I yelled in frustration, kicking the ledge of the roof. As I hopped around and cursed at my own stupidity, my cell rang. I hurried to fish it out to see Beckett's number. Beckett? Where are you? This Finnick, a woman asked. Laughter came through the line. Yeah, who is this? Rose Beckett's boss. You might want to come to the bookstore. Quick if you can. Is she all right? I asked, rushing for the door to the stairs. To find all right, she replied. I'll keep her here, but she's not in a good state. She said to call you. Hope that was okay. It is. I'll be there as fast as I can. I hung up, swung by the loft to grab Beckett's truck keys and let Frankie know where she was. 
I told him we'd be back as soon as we could, then I floored it through the city to get to Rose's bookstore. I swung into a spot along the curb when I arrived and ran inside. I was met with a concerned-looking older woman with white hair, wearing leather pants and a long-sleeved blue shirt. If I hadn't known who Beckett's mother was, I'd say this mortal right here was her grandmother, if nothing else. She had her arms crossed and was looking into the bookstore. Giggling came from the stacks. I frowned. Is that Beckett? Yep, that's her all right. Drunk as a damn skunk. She came in ranting about her mom and some baby, and then she started drinking. Not sure what she's doing now. A thud followed her words, quickly followed by two more. She rolled her eyes toward the ceiling. Well, she's pulling books off the shelves, but I'm not sure what for. She hasn't told you anything? Nope, nothing. I blew out a heavy breath, wishing Beckett had waited like I asked her to go see her mom. Hell, I would have gone with her. She might not want to talk to me. I told you she asked for you. Go on. She shooed me toward the shelves, and I went. More thuds punctuated the silence of the bookstore, along with more giggling and a few words every now and then. They were hard to make out, she was slurring so much. I followed the sounds of the thudding and came across her sitting on the floor in a heap with a bottle of whiskey in her right hand while she pulled books off the shelves with her left. There was already a large pile all around her in haphazard stacks. Her hair was a mess, and her red eyes told me she'd been crying. Beckett. She dragged another book off the shelf and held it by the front cover. The pages fell open, and she grimaced bitterly at them. Then she tossed it at my feet. Liars. Who? I asked, worried for a second someone was talking to her. I wondered if Harriet had cast some spell of madness on Beckett when she was confronted. I crouched in front of Beckett and picked up the book. It appeared to be a fictional story about a witch. The story? They're all a bunch of liars, she muttered and took a large gulp of whiskey from the bottle. She wiped her arm on her sleeve and picked up another book, then tossed it at me. And this one, and this one, she repeated herself as she threw book after book at my feet. When she chucked one over my head and it smashed into one of the display tables, she giggled, then hiccuped. Oops. I think you've had enough of that, I said and reached for the bottle. No. This is my booze, she yelled. Get your own, you thief. Just magic it. Poof. I can't do that right now, remember. I reached for the bottle again, but Beckett hugged it to her chest. I sighed. Fine, you can keep it, but I'm taking you back to your loft, all right. What's the point? She sniffed hard. Tears shimmered in her eyes. None of it was real. None of it. And these stories. These stories that I read growing up, everyone was happy. They had happy lives. With happy families. And happy endings. She drained more from the bottle. Tears streamed down her face as she ranted, but they're all lies. There's no such thing as love or happiness. It doesn't exist. None of it does. She seemed to shrink in on herself as the tears continued to fall. I'm nothing because of her. She never loved me. Never. My whole life, everything, it's just a story, but not a happy story. Oh no, I can't have that. I get an effing tragedy. I glanced over my shoulder. Rose studied Beckett sympathetically. The old woman cared more for this witch than it seemed Harriet Jenkins would ever care for her daughter. Rose looked at me. I nodded, hoping I appeared reassuring. You're not nothing, I told Beckett, and sat down all the way with her after scooting some books to the side. Yes, I am, she mumbled with a pout so severe I had to bite back a laugh. No, you're not. I've seen your place and your work. I'm sure a lot of witches and mortals, and even Demis you've helped, would agree with me. Slowly, not wanting to startle her, I wiped the tears from her cheeks with my thumb. Her lower lip quivered, and I waited for the waterworks to start all over again. You are one of the most driven people I've ever seen. You are fully dedicated to your craft. It's not your fault your magic has never been strong. Though you're right. 
she set the whiskey bottle down hard. I cringed, amazed it hadn't shattered. I tried to grab for it, but then it was to her lips again as she gulped the amber liquor down. It's her fault. The witch. All her fault. Yes, it is. She should pay for her crimes, she said and tried to stand too fast. She toppled over backward into another shelf, then burst out laughing. I took a chance to rush in and pick her up. I managed to get her up and over my shoulder while she laughed and at the same time cursed Harriet. Revenge. I want revenge. You hear me. I'm gonna kick her ass, she bellowed, her head hanging around the middle of my back while I clutched her legs. Carefully stepping over piles of books, I made it to the main aisle. Rose made an attempt for the whiskey bottle, but Beckett clicked her tongue and wagged her finger in the old woman's face. I'll get her home, I promised Rose. Let you know how she is tomorrow. I can come in and clean up the mess too. No, I don't mind. Just make sure she's all right. She looked as pissed as I felt at Beckett's mom for driving her to drink like this. I had a feeling Beckett was not one for getting wasted. She's going to feel like shit tomorrow. Yeah, she probably is. If I had use of my power, I'd ease her hangover. Depending on how bad it was, I was considering sacrificing a few hours as a jackass if it helped. Call you tomorrow. With Beckett still laughing, cursing and hiccuping pretty consistently, I carried her to her truck and set her down in the passenger seat. I buckled her in and gave up on trying to take the whiskey away. Once I was behind the wheel, I put the truck in drive and made a U-turn to head to her loft. We were halfway there when Beckett shouted at the top of her lungs. Stop. I jerked the wheel to the right, cut off another car, and made it to the curb as horns blared. What? I yelled in a panic. Beckett. Her eyes were wide and the grin on her face was mischievous. She glanced at me, then the whiskey bottle. Hold that thought, she murmured. Gripping the bottle by the neck, she upended it and downed the little bit that was left. She tossed it in the back seat of her truck and turned to me. You can follow directions, right? Beckett, we really should get you home. No, I don't want to go home. Would you want to go home after what I found out? I tapped my fingers on the steering wheel, studying her. Is it worse than just learning Harriet's the reason for the magical binding? Beckett slouched in her seat. She's pregnant. Your mom. Yep, and you want to know why? She thinks I'm a failure because I couldn't break the binding she placed on me as an infant. She spat. That was a test. You're joking, right? I am not. She was told she would have a daughter of immense power and blah 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 whatever. She placed a binding on me to test my powers, but I failed. I failed her test, so now she's going to have another child. One to replace me. But she removed the binding, right? Beckett's glare was answer enough. I want to hurt her, Finnick, and I know just how to do it. I don't think that's a good idea. You shouldn't be using your magic when you're drunk. Who said anything about magic? She rubbed her hands together then nodded to the road. So, can you follow directions? Thirty minutes later, as Beckett directed me to pull down a gravel drive with only the headlights to guide us, I regretted listening to the drunk witch in the seat beside me. The road turned and a house appeared in the lights ahead. The porch was illuminated by a few lanterns on posts. Maple trees surrounded the house. I parked and Beckett hopped out as I turned the engine off. Are you sure she's not here? No. She and my father are at the coven house until the fall rituals are completed. And with her being pregnant, who the hell knows how long she'll be there? She yelled as I hurried to catch up to her. I have all the time in the world. We followed a stone path around the side of the house to an iron gate. She stopped short of it, muttered under her breath, and sighed. Is it locked? I asked. She nodded. I expected her to try and use a spell to unlock it. Instead, she backed up and cocked her leg, ready to kick it in. Except she was still barefoot. I lunged forward at the last second and grabbed her around the middle, lifted her off her feet and spun her around. 
I have to do this, she yelled. You're not going to stop me. I'm going to stop you from breaking your foot. Just stay there. I set her further down the path and studied the gate. I grabbed it and gave it a hard push. When it didn't move, I stepped back and did exactly as Beckett had been about to do. Two solid kicks and the gate swung inward. There, now it's open. Beckett stormed past me and into a large yard with flower gardens, vegetables, and a greenhouse near the back. She reached the first garden bed, bent over, and started ripping plants out by the roots. Dirt flew. With it were leaves, flowers, and budding plants. She was halfway through the first garden bed when her head shot up and she glanced around. I'd been staying clear of the debris and mostly ensuring she didn't hurt herself. When she straightened so abruptly, I was worried the whiskey had caught up to her. Then she marched out of the garden, grabbed a shovel from the back of the house, and went right back to her destructive activities. All the while, she ranted about Harriet. I didn't interrupt her. I just stood there, watching sweat bead on Beckett's forehead and how hard she gripped that shovel. It roused my own anger. My father wasn't in the picture, and my mother was essentially not going to be either. Beckett had two healthy parents who should be there for her. Instead, they seemed ready to throw her out on her ass and disown, rather than show her the love and compassion she deserved. Beckett screamed, then stormed out of the gardens toward the greenhouse. She held the shovel over her shoulder like a baseball bat. I spotted a garden hoe near the spot where she'd found the shovel and joined her at the greenhouse door. What are you doing? she asked, giving me a look. I have my own anger to work out, I replied. You sure you want to go this far? She stole the witch I could have been, Finnick. This greenhouse is one of her most prized possessions in the world. She loves the damn place more than she ever loved me. You tell me if you think I want to go this far. All I needed to know. Anger about Harriet's sins combined with my fury at Dion. It all welled inside me. I swung the hoe back, then smashed it right through the greenhouse door. Glass shattered to the ground. I reached inside to unlock it. Once the door was open, Beckett tiptoed around the glass shards and headed inside. I worried about her feet, but not for long. She swung that shovel like a madwoman. Ceramic pots exploded on impact. She overturned tables. I did the same on the right side of the greenhouse, smashing and destroying everything in my path. This greenhouse had once been nice. A peaceful place that reminded me a bit of Beckett's love. Her home, though, had a sense of comfort to it. Good chaos. This place was far too organized and structured for my taste. There were no crazy vines stretching up the walls, or intriguing new plant species, or a tangled mess of dried herbs hanging from the ceiling. Everything had its place. Or it did, until we came along and utterly destroyed it. Nowhere within the realm of the greenhouse or the gardens did I sense a hint of Beckett. She was better off without Harriet. It would take her time to understand that, but she would survive this. Unless, of course, we couldn't prove to the elders that Harriet was the reason for all of Beckett's troubles. Then her powers would be bound, and she'd be mortal. That could not happen. I would not let it. I froze with the whole mid-swing, on the way to smashing another window. I had never had much time or patience to care for someone else's shitty life problems. Here I was destroying a greenhouse with a witch I met two weeks ago. All because she needed me to be here for her. For the last couple of days, I hadn't thought much about my curse and how it affected me. I was more worried about Beckett. So much for shoving my feelings for her aside. I rested the hoe against the table behind me and turned to find Beckett breathing heavy and still wielding the shovel like a bat. The greenhouse was pretty much demolished. Beckett, how about we get you home now? The shovel fell from her hands and clanged against the stone floor. She turned her head to the right and vomited. I held her hair out of her face and rubbed her back as she heaved. Go away, she mumbled. You don't need to see this. Not the first person I've seen puke. God of parties and all that shit, remember? She heaved again then trembled as if she was cold. Probably was since she was barefoot. 
Without a word, I scooped her up to stop her from stepping in any glass and carried her out of the greenhouse. She curled against my chest and the strangest sensation spread through me as I glanced at her. Love wasn't real. I could never believe it was. Not after all the heartbreak and pain I'd seen caused by the gods. Then there was this witch in my arms, who I hated to be apart from. She made me smile and laugh. And kissing her, God's kissing her was like being awoken from a deep slumber. Being with her was not just a distraction. I wanted to be with her and keep being with her. Curse or no curse. Magic or no magic. On the drive to the loft, she fell asleep, slumped against my arm. I started to shift it but she snuggled closer, resting her cheek on my thigh. My hand ended up on her hip, just like it belonged there. No matter what happened next, either with her coven or her mother, I'd be there for her. Revenge against Dion was still part of my plans. I'd just have to keep her as far away from those plans as possible. Unless of course the curse remained and Beckett lost her magic. Then we could simply be mortals together. I suppose there were worse things. My hand curled around the steering wheel as I parked the truck outside Beckett's loft. Making Dion pay had been the only thing I'd cared about for so long. Letting it go just like that was impossible. If I went after him while bearing this curse, I risked being stuck like a jackass forever. Or worse. Beckett said, there was a tiny chance the curse was going to eventually kill me. I jerked my fist back, from slamming it into the steering wheel. Beckett shifted but didn't wake up. Finding another witch to lift my curse was a slim possibility. Tonight, I'd focus on getting Beckett tucked in and be there for her when she woke tomorrow. Then we'd have a serious discussion about what we did next. I'd planned to crash on the couch, but when I'd laid Beckett in her bed, she'd passed out while clutching my hand. I'd ended up sitting up in bed with her, watching over her while Frankie sat on the nightstand. I caught him up on everything I found out, but until Beckett was awake and sober, I wasn't 100% certain I'd heard the whole story. I hadn't intended to fall asleep. Beckett yelped in surprise. I bolted upright to find I was lying in bed right beside her. Her hair was a mess and she was a bit on the pale side, but gods did she look beautiful. I could get used to seeing her face every morning. Her cheeks reddened the longer I looked. Finnick? She looked down and sighed in relief. We're not naked. I laughed through my yawn. No, we're not. Nothing happened last night, except for you getting drunk and destroying your mother's greenhouse with a shovel. Wait. That wasn't a dream. Her eyes widened, and she smacked herself in the forehead with her palm. I thought it was a dream. Oh, goddess, she's going to kill me. No, she's not. Yeah, she will. Who else would destroy her precious gardens, she snapped. I called in a favor last night. Had some friends go over and really mess the place up. Left a few traces of demi-magic, too. She'll never know you were there. I tucked her hair behind her ears, and her cheeks turned an even darker shade of red. I'll go make some coffee and you can tell me, coherently this time, what happened after you flew off yesterday. I slid off the bed and traipsed downstairs. After I freshened up in the bathroom, I headed to the kitchen to make a pot of coffee. Frankie was waiting for me on the counter. The shower was running upstairs. Beckett could be in there for a while, so I started the coffee then walked around her loft, picking up the remnants of yesterday's spell. Frankie's tiny antennae snail eyes were on me the entire time. I finally returned to the kitchen, crossed my arms, and looked right back at him. What? I hope this isn't all for show, he replied stiffly. It's not. My eyes flicked to the loft, but Beckett hadn't come out of the bathroom yet. I'll admit this is a bit new to me, feeling like this for someone, but it's not fake. I like her, Frankie. Like her a hell of a lot. He slid across the counter toward me. His body shifted and shimmered, and the voice that came out of his tiny mouth was filled with barely held back anger. If you break her heart, he said with a hiss as he shifted into the large tarantula and clicked those pincers at me, I'll make that curse of yours the least of your worries. Got it. You've been warned. 
I place my hand over my heart. Swear. I won't hurt her. Even as I said it, a voice of doubt reared its head in the back of my mind. Every woman I'd ever been with ended up hurt because of me. Better not, Frankie muttered. Then his body shimmered again as he returned to his snail form. If I was to really help Beckett, then I needed to get my powers back. The only way to remove the binding left by her mother was for me to do it myself. The coven wasn't going to do it, not with Harriet manipulating them. The question remained how to remove the curse. Last night, I thought I was ready to give up my quest for revenge and lose a whole half of myself for Beckett, but it made me sick this morning to think of letting Dion's crimes go unpunished. Being the good guy was a lot harder than it looked. I was not as self-sacrificing as I let myself believe. A fluttery panic started in my chest, and I was anxious to get out of Beckett's loft for a few hours until I could clear my head. An idea was forming in my mind, and it was a damn stupid one. If Beckett found out, she'd try to stop me, even if it was our only chance. I poured two mugs of coffee and added sugar to Beckett's as she came downstairs in jeans and a black sweater. Her hair was pulled back. She took the mug I offered her. Tell us all about it, I told her once she sat down at the small kitchen table. She leaned against the wall, propped her feet on the corner of the table, and started talking. This time, her story wasn't interrupted by mad bouts of giggling or random cursing outbursts. She told Frankie and me, from start to finish, about her conversation with Harriet. By the time she finished ended it with how she rushed out of the coven house, binding still intact, there was a single tear falling down her cheek. She hastily wiped it away and set her coffee aside. I'm sorry, Finnick, she said after a long pause. I never should have said I could help you. I can't do anything. Plus, I'm going to lose my magic in a few days. You're better off finding someone else. The way she said it made me think she wasn't just talking about my finding another witch to remove the curse. I set down my coffee and knelt in front of her. I took her hand and shook my head. I don't want to find someone else. Finnick, I'm going to be a mortal in a few days. You'll still be cursed. We don't know what else that curse is going to do to you. You can't stay here with me. You shouldn't want to. How about you let me make up my own mind? I pulled her to her feet and kissed her, fisting my hands in the back of her sweater as she clung to my shoulders. I lifted her off her feet and spun her around so she could sit on the counter. The whole world could have been burning at that moment, but nothing else mattered except this witch in my arms. She was quickly becoming a very important part of my life. I didn't understand it, or I just didn't want to admit that Garth was right and I was falling for Beckett. Falling in love with her. Instead of breaking the kiss, I brought Beckett closer, maybe afraid letting her go would mean I'd lose her. There had to be a way to get us both the happy ending we deserved. All I had to do was remove the curse, then Beckett could keep her magic, and I would have an ally in the fight against Dion. Telling her about my mother and my asshole of a father wouldn't be easy but she'd given me so much of her life already. It was only fair I opened up to her. Finding the courage to do so was not easy. I deepened the kiss, and she wrapped her arms around me. Everything about this witch and me was right, so damned right. She smiled against my lips as we came up for air. We all, we should talk about all this, she murmured. At some point. We will. I kissed the tip of her nose, her cheeks, then her forehead. You should take the day to rest. Call Rose. She'll want to know you're fine. To find fine. I hugged Beckett and rested my cheek atop her head. Frankie met my gaze, and something in the snail's eyes said he was peering into my soul. Did I make my promise too soon? I cleared my throat and forced myself to put a little distance between Beckett and me. I have a few things to take care of today, I told her. I'll come back later tonight if you want. Or I can just wait until tomorrow. Tonight's fine. What are you up to? She asked. I shrugged. Just demi duties and all that crap. Nothing exciting. You're a shitty ass liar. 
I kissed her until we were both struggling to breathe. Distracting me like that is so not fair, she said with a pout as I backed away and finally let go of her hands. All is fair in love. I winked as she rolled her eyes. I'll be back later. Promise. The second I was in the elevator heading down to the lobby, I pulled out my cell and called Garth. Hey, I said when he answered. I need a favor. You're not going to like it. Chapter 10 Finnick The calendar loomed as Beckett frantically flipped through pages of one of her spellbooks. She bit her lips so hard, I figured she was going to start bleeding. We were two days away from the day she'd have to face the elders, and no closer to removing my curse. Time was running out for both of us. I checked my cell again, but there was no text or missed call. This was a terrible idea, but I was out of options. So was Beckett. Damn it. She slammed the book shut and chucked it across her loft. I hate this. I pulled her against me. She buried her face in my chest and continued to grumble and curse. We're not giving up, all right. We'll fix this. How? She pushed away and charged around her loft. I can't remove the binding because my magic's messed up because of the binding, she rambled. And your curse, what if it's eating away at your soul or something and I can't stop it? I can't, she stopped, swallowed hard and shook her head frantically. I can't let anything happen to you. But it's out of my control. I cut off her pacing and dragged her to the couch, sat her down and held her until her breathing steadied. She finally gave in and slumped against me. You just have to have a little faith. The answer will come to you. You'll lift the binding and we'll remove the curse, then bam, everything will be good. We can do fun things that couples do, instead of me panicking every time you try a new spell on yourself. She sat up with a smile. Fun things couples do. Yeah, like go see a movie, or take a walk in the park, or shit, I don't know, actually go out to eat instead of ordering takeout. She grinned, and then she was laughing quietly. What? You called us a couple. I blinked. Guess I did. I think I like the sound of that. Me too. And as your newly appointed boyfriend, can you please listen to me and stop stressing? You're funny, you know that. You need a break. My cell vibrated in my pocket, and I pulled it out to find the message I was worried I was never going to get. Why don't I run out and grab some food from the diner, and when I get back, we'll watch a movie, take a few hours to ourselves, then we can go back to the mad hunt for a way to solve our problems. Deal. Fine, deal. I get to pick the movie, though. I kissed her one more time. Sounds fair. I'll be back soon. She tilted her head, studying me closely. This is all just a bit new to me. Don't want to mess it up. Then don't, she said as if it was as simple as those two words. Going to go change into comfy clothes. Don't take too long. She darted up the spiral stairs as I looked around for my leather jacket and boots. They were both by the door. As I slipped them on, I reread the message on my cell. Figures she'd want to meet in the park. I glanced around, but there was no sign of Frankie. I called Garth. Yeah, he asked. Karina messaged me. Park. Twenty minutes. You still willing to be my backup? Who else is going to do it for you? Please tell me you told Beckett. No. I'm keeping her as far away from that evil bitch as I can. See you soon. I disconnected the call, zipped up my jacket, then headed out the door. I'd contacted Karina the day after Beckett's drunken rampage. She'd taken this long to respond to me, but at least she did. My only option as far as I could see was to beg Karina to remove the curse. I'd pay whatever she asked as long as she lifted it so I could help Beckett and get back at Dion. I took a cab to the park and hopped out near the sidewalk that led to the stone fountain. Garth texted me, saying he was there but staying out of sight. I didn't want Karina knowing I hadn't come alone as she'd instructed. I walked around the fountain, then sat on the edge of it. Dion's face was still destroyed from my last visit here. 
I was quite all right with that. I checked myself for the time and urged the minutes to move faster. My gut told me this was a terrible idea, but we were out of options. My, my, Karina's voice suddenly came from behind me and I jumped to my feet. She wore another tight-fitting black dress with a plunging neckline, slits up the sides, and that same blinking eye amulet around her neck. Her sneer was filled with amusement as she walked toward me, cloak billowing behind her. This I did not expect. You've had your fun, I told her. Remove the curse, Karina. I've learned my lesson, and I'm sorry for what I did to you. I am. She tapped her finger to her chin. Is that so? Yes, it is. Now remove it. Please. Hum, I quite like you begging. You should do it some more. She laughed and came closer. I forced myself to keep my feet planted and not dart away from her. She trailed sharp a nail down my cheek then circled around me. I must admit, I did not foresee you coming to me like this. I have no other choice. You do. You can continue to live with this curse or waste countless years finding someone to do it for you. She pressed her lips to my neck, and my skin crawled as she took a deep breath. You smell different. Happens. The curse, Karina. Are you going to remove it, or not? Neither of us has all night. A bit pushy, aren't we? She scolded as she came back around to face me. Her eyes narrowed, then widened. Ah, I see, you're not here for yourself. Interesting. Very interesting indeed. Lying would be pointless. It's true. It's for a woman. But not your mother. Oh no, you've met someone, and you actually care for her. She breathed in deeply again, then her lip curled in disgust. A witch. Yes. I would have thought you learned your lesson by now, to steer clear of our kind. Karina, please, just tell me what you want to remove the curse. I'm a demi. I can promise you anything. It's been weeks. Just lift the curse, and we can come to some sort of arrangement. My fingers twitched at my sides, willing her to make up her damn mind. I could sense it. She was up to something, and it was not going to be good. This was exactly why I hadn't wanted Beckett here. You're willing to do anything? I gritted my teeth as I nodded. Anything. Very well. She leaned in closer and whispered, Hiss me. What? No. I staggered back. She sighed. That's my price for removing the curse. One kiss. And not just a simple kiss. I want a real kiss. One with passion and meaning. She smiled darkly. I want you to kiss me, as if I was your new witchy girlfriend. My stomach twisted. Not happening. Anything else? No, you said you would pay any price. That's my price. She rested her hands on her hips. If you say no, then you'll never be able to make Dion pay. Or help your mother. Or even help poor Beckett Jenkins. I flinched at the harshness at which she said Beckett's name. How do you know about her? I have my ways. She turned and started to walk away. Oh well. Just stop. I ran my hands through my hair, then stomped toward her. One kiss. That's it. That's it, and once it's over, the curse will be removed, and I will never see you again. It sounds like a good deal to me. I would take it if I were you. I swallowed hard, and prayed to every god in my family tree that Beckett would never learn about how I was able to relieve myself of the curse and save her at the same time. I stepped closer. Then, not letting myself think about it too long, I kissed Karina. I ended it as quickly as I could, yet she frowned up. What? I kissed you. I said a passionate kiss. That was pathetic. She grabbed my shoulders and shoved her chest against mine. I want a real kiss, Finnick, or the deal's off. Being around Karina was the complete opposite of being near Beckett. Everything about this situation was just wrong. My muscles tensed as if ready to make a break for it, but I came here for a reason, and I wasn't leaving until I had a surefire way to help Beckett. Fine, you want a real kiss? 
I asked and dug deep until I found the Finnick everyone saw me as, the one I hoped I could leave behind now that Beckett was in my life. You got it, sweetheart. I wrapped an arm around Karina's waist and lowered my mouth to hers. This time when I kissed her, I shut my eyes and imagined it was Beckett in my arms. I used all my willpower to believe that's who I was kissing with such intensity, trying to tell her that everything I did was for the sake of our future together. When the kiss ended, and I stepped back, Karina was grinning mischievously with a glint in her eyes. I wiped my mouth on my arm and was prepared to ask her if it was done or not when a voice called out. One that made my heart stop. Finnick? No, why was she here? Slowly, I turned around. Beckett stood a few yards away. Garth was right behind her, cringing. He mouthed an apology. Beckett's face was twisted in anger. Then I realized she wasn't looking at me. She was glaring at Karina. What did you promise him, huh? She shouted as she marched over. What? Karina's grin faltered as she realized Beckett wasn't upset about the kiss. Or if she was, she sure as hell wasn't showing it. We made a deal. Beckett scoffed, then smacked me in the shoulder. What the hell is wrong with you? I'm sorry, all right. But we were running out of time, and I can help you now. Oh, she told you what? A kiss for your powers back. For her to remove the curse. By the goddess, Finnick, are you really that stupid? This is a trap. How can you not see that? She hit me again, and I winced. Why didn't you tell me this was your plan? Because I was trying to protect you. You're an idiot. You know that. She's never just going to remove the curse without taking something in return. She did. The curse for a kiss, that was the deal. Right. I snapped, turning back to Karina. Yes, that was the deal. Beckett stepped between us, her hands glowing violet, as if she was making ready to cast a spell on the Dark Witch. Get away from him right now, before I make you regret coming here. What are you going to do? Karina whispered haughtily. We both know you have no power. You should listen to your boyfriend. I should kick your ass, Beckett shot back, then whirled around to glare at me. You never should have come here. She's evil. No good can come from making a deal with her, or having anything to do with her. But she removed the curse, I argued. Yeah. Why do I doubt that? She scowled then shoved around me toward the sidewalk. Beckett, I yelled, and she stopped short. Power rose within me, and I welcomed it, not feeling the bonds of the curse Karina had placed on me. I pictured the black vine, twisted around Beckett's magical core, then imagined it being obliterated by my power. The amount of energy it took stole the air from my lungs. Beckett gasped and clutched at her chest, her whole body limbed by a brilliant white light. She sank to her knees as the light pulsed around her then slowly dissipated. Slowly she found her feet and spun around, a confused look on her face. See. I told you it was worth it. She seemed too stunned to say anything as magic rushed to her hands. She held them in disbelief, but when her gaze flicked to me, she ran forward. Finnick. My body took on the same glow hers had. I frowned at my glowing limbs, then doubled over as a sharp pain shot through my gut. Beckett and Garth were at my side trying to haul me upright, but the pain increased and it felt as if someone was stabbing me with a hot poker. The light condensed and shot out of my body. And right into the eye amulet around Karina's neck. She threw her arms to the side as the power of the gods lit up the amulet until it blinded me. She sucked in a deep breath, then let it out. Thank you, Finnick. The price has been paid. I hope you enjoy your lives together. What? I gasped and stumbled forward. No, you bitch. Karina wiggled her fingers, then with a wink, vanished. My power, my god side was gone. She'd stolen it from me the second I used my abilities to save Beckett. I was mortal. Completely and utterly mortal. Finnick? Beckett said. I yanked my arm away from her. We'll get it back, she tried to reassure me. How? I grabbed at my chest, feeling a hole inside me. 
I have nothing now. Nothing. You have me. You released the binding. I have full range of my magic for the first time since I was born, she said as she tried to take my hand again. I removed it from her grasp. Her eyes turned stormy, her hands falling to her sides. Don't do this. Don't pull away from me. I can help you now. No, you can't. I laughed bitterly as I backed away from her. You don't get it. I just lost everything. I'm nothing now. And Dion will get away with hurting my mother. He'll never be forced to pay for what he did to her. You stole my chance for revenge. My chance to make him pay. It's gone, all gone, all because of you. Finnick, Garth said. You don't mean that. Yeah, I do, I yelled. Beckett's eyes darkened even more. I was unstoppable. I've planned revenge for years, and now I can't do anything. I never should have come to you for help. Beckett worked her jaw, then lifted her chin. You're right. You shouldn't have. You've ruined everything for me. I ranted as my anger spilled out of me in waves that had my hand shaking. Just hours ago, I'd been so sure of my plan. Now, I was lost in a dark void with no clear way out. This is all your fault. How is it my fault? You never told me anything about your mother or Dion. Why wouldn't you just let me in? Because it's not your business. Really? Because in most couple situations, the parties are there for each other, you moron. I trusted you this whole time. Why didn't you trust me? I said nothing. She nervously tapped her fingers on her thighs. Fine. What happened to your mother? She was driven mad by Dion. Happy. I paced away from her, then came right back, my anger growing with each pounding beat of my heart. She lives in an asylum and doesn't know me most of the time. Her mind is failing her, and it's all because of him. He did that to her. He broke her, and I swore I would find a way to help her and make him pay. Now, I can't do any of that, and it's all your fault. I didn't tell you to come here and make a deal with an evil witch. No. What other choice did I have? Not like you were much help. Can't do anything except blow things up and make bubbles. How are bubbles going to help me get revenge, Beckett? How are they going to save my mother from impending madness? The punch caught me off guard. Blood filled my mouth from a newly split lip. Beckett's hand was raised as if to strike me again, but she didn't. Go to hell, she muttered, turned on her heel, and stormed away. You better go after her right now, Garth snapped. What the hell for? You're kidding me, right? Finnick, you love her, and she might still love you if you go and apologize right now. Why should I? Just leave me alone. I stalked toward the fountain and sat on the ledge. With my face in my hands, I sulked in my rage at losing the only chance I had to set my world right again. I'd wasted all my magic on saving Beckett. I wanted to scream at the world and curse at how unfair it was. This was exactly what happened when love got mixed in. All it did was cause heartbreak and pain and make everyone involved go crazy. A hand grabbed me by my shirt. Garth pushed me backward into the fountain. The cold water was a shock to my system and soaked me straight to the bone. When Garth finally let me up, I was shaking and my teeth chattered. What the hell is wrong with you? I yelled, but then he did it again and again until I was sure I was going to die from the cold. When he finally let me go, I slumped to the pavement and glared up at him. You need a wake-up call right now. That witch you just yelled at is the one for you. The only one in this world, and it's time you admit it. You messed up big time. I suggest you find a way to make it right. How can I, when she cost me everything? Did she? You're not this stupid. Beckett is a powerful witch. You said yourself you sensed her magic simmering below the surface. Now that she has it all, you really think she won't drop everything to help you? Garth crossed his arms and glared at me. Well? When I said nothing, he walked away. Where are you going? Home. Find your own ride, dumbass. 
I sat there on the ground, soaking wet, as I tried to tell myself my anger was justified. I bashed my fist into the edge of the fountain. The pain jarred me from my anger, and I let out a stream of curses. What had I just done? Garth was right about everything. I messed up, and there might not be a way to come back from this mistake. Staying here and doing nothing wasn't an option. I had to try and get Beckett back. Why hadn't I trusted her with the truth? Just come out and told her why it was so important the curse be removed. She had let me into her life, her world, and I turned around and blamed her for ruining mine. I kicked her right back down to where she'd been when I met her. I hauled my soaking wet ass off the sidewalk and headed for my apartment. I'd go home, change, then come up with a game plan. This could not wait until morning. I didn't care if I had to stay outside her place all night or for days. Weeks even. I was going to fix this if it was the last thing I did. I couldn't lose Beckett. I wouldn't. Chapter 11 Beckett The second Frankie had told me what he overheard Finnick talking about on the phone, I'd rushed out of my loft with the intention to stop him from doing something stupid. The events that took place at the park were on repeat inside my mind as I soared through the air on my broom. Finnick kissing Karina had ticked me off, not because I thought he still had feelings for her, but because he was too desperate to realize the trap he'd fallen into. If he just talked to me, I could have stopped all of this. Now, I wasn't sure what was going to happen to us. I screamed my frustration to the night sky and jerked my broom to a stop with only the stars to witness me falling apart. Finnick's mom was insane. This whole time, I thought he simply wanted the curse removed so he could go back to his old life. Even after the time we spent together, the nagging voice was always there telling me he was simply using me. Then he had to go and risk everything for me. Why were men so freaking complicated? And stoic and obnoxiously hard-headed? Doesn't matter, I muttered to myself as I continued toward the coven house. He made it perfectly clear he doesn't want you in his life. But no matter what he said in his moment of rage, I was going to find a way to restore his power just as he did for me. Then we'd be even, and we'd never have to see each other again. I like to think I'd never think of him again either, but that was a load of horse shit. There wasn't a day that would pass when he wouldn't be on my mind. I steeled my nerves as I reached the coven house and landed gently on the front lawn. My meeting with the elders and my mother was still technically a day away, but now that my power had been restored, I wanted to get this done and over with. I had work to do, and did not need their threats or disapproval or the coven itself hanging over my head. I'd prove to them my power was in pristine condition, then officially leave the coven and my family. They were never anything to me, but a dark cloud constantly following me around. Beckett? Todd said as I entered the front door. You're early? Call them, I said as I shrank my broom down to size and tucked it away in my pocket. It's late. Many of them are in bed or preparing for the next round of rituals. I leaned on the front desk and let my newly released magic flow over the surface. Todd's eyes widened. His gaze locked onto mine. Call them. Now. Don't make me ask again. He bobbed his head and tapped a stack of papers on the desk. They came to life one after the other. Scrawling letters appeared in a message, then they lined up beside him, awaiting their next order. Where would you like to meet them? Todd asked nervously. I straightened, but didn't bother reining in my magic. It spent years cooped up inside me, and I was more than ready to let it out. Finally, I was complete. There was no more gaping hole inside me. Well, except where Finnick had ripped my heart apart. I shoved aside my emotions for him. Tonight, I had to focus on me. The main chamber. I'll be waiting for them. I walked away without another glance and aimed for the center of the coven house. With a snap of my fingers, I changed my entire outfit, knowing it would piss my mother off to see me in something so different from what witches were supposed to wear when meeting with the elders. My black leather pants shone under the lights of the hall. My black boots were laced to my knees, 
and I changed to a red corset over a lacy black bell sleeve shirt. I ran my finger lightly down the piercings in my ear. They too shifted and became black and red to match the rest of my ensemble. Who said a good witch couldn't look damned good in all black? Well, black with a touch of red. I smirked then approached the chamber doors. With a flick of my wrist they opened for me, and I stepped inside. Spells came to me so easily now, it was incredible. Almost like a dream. I stood in the center of the chamber, and waited. One by one, the elders of our coven entered wearing dark violet robes. They each took a chair, forming a circle around the center of the room. My mother was the last to enter. When her eyes found mine, my lips twitched and she froze. It was the first time I'd ever seen her looking worried. Almost afraid. Good she should be. I hadn't come here tonight to simply prove I could use magic. Oh no, I came here for a very different reason. I was done playing by her rules. Finished. Tonight she'd be playing by mine. And it was all thanks to Finnick. A slight pang shot through my chest at the thought of him and what he'd said to me, but I'd deal with him later. Thank you for agreeing to see me, I said once my mother finally took her seat. We agreed to meet in one day's time, my mother said, sounding bored. Why have you called us here early, Beckett? Unless, of course, you've come to see reason. Quite the opposite, actually. I spread my arms wide. I have discovered something quite alarming, that I believe you all must be made aware of. My mother shifted in her chair and shot me a warning look. Enough of your games, daughter. No, enough of yours, I shot back. As you might be able to tell, there is something different about me tonight. I snapped my fingers, and a beautiful array of flowers grew and blossomed around the entire floor. They spread out like a carpet. The elders exclaimed in surprise. Several trees grew as well, and vines stretched out to cover the walls. I snapped my fingers again, and an imitation of the night sky appeared above head. As you can see, my magic works without a hitch. How is this possible? One of the elders asked. Her name was Marie, and she had always been one of the few who was not easily swayed by my mother's antics. It would appear my magic has been cursed from the very beginning. Someone bound it when I was an infant, and thanks to the help of a demigod, I have finally been released from that binding. I spread my arms wide, and the indoor forest I created shimmered away. Who would do such a thing to an infant? Marie asked, as the elders put their heads together, whispering and frowning at one another. Harriet, how did you not know about this situation? Oh she did, I answered for my mother. She was the one who did it. The elders fell silent. One by one, their heads turned until they all stared at my mother. She, however, was looking right at me. What's the matter? Don't have anything to say. She's lying, she replied. Can't you see this is all some sort of trick? Why would I place a binding on my own daughter? Apparently, she believed I was going to be some all-powerful prodigy, I answered. She cast a spell to test me and it appeared I'd failed. All my magical flaws have been her fault from the beginning. My mother gripped the arms of her chair even more tightly. You speak out of turn, daughter. Stop with the games. If they want to know the truth, they can simply pull it from my mind. I'm more than willing to let them see the memories of my visit just a few days ago. Are you? The temperature in the room plummeted, and this time I knew it was because of me. So many years of pent-up rage bubbled to the surface that storm clouds formed and lightning streaked through them. Thunder rumbled loudly in the chamber, and gusts of freezing cold wind kicked up. Harriet, I demand to know if you did this, Marie said sternly. We all know about what the oracle saw. Please, for the love of the goddess, prove to us you did not harm your only child. I counted off the seconds, as the storm built with every moment it took for my mother to answer. Then she stood and held her hands to her belly. She is not my only child. More whispers and gasps of surprise mingled with the rising storm. You have already come to a decision as far as Beckett Jenkins, and as part of this council of elders, I order us to proceed. She pointed an accusing finger at me as I scoffed. 
Her magic is to be permanently bound. Marie rose as I opened my mouth to tell my mother off. She held up her hand and glowered at Harriet. That judgment call was made under false pretenses. An investigation will be conducted into your actions against a member of this coven. As of this moment, the title of elder is no longer yours to claim. She turned to me as my mother's jaw dropped, then snapped shut again, eyes narrowed with rage. Beckett, I would very much like to witness this conversation you had with your mother, as well as understand what binding she used on you. I'm more than happy to discuss it with you, Marie. I wasn't out of the woods quite yet, but I wouldn't be losing my magic anytime soon. Marie called for the guards, and two men in gray suits entered the chamber. They went to her side and listened to whatever orders she gave them. My mother remained perfectly motionless the entire time, but the strangest sensation of something crawling up my ankle drew my attention. Stretching across the ground, hidden beneath a thin layer of fog appeared a black thorny vine. I jerked my leg back with a curse in time for two more to appear. The elders noticed my movements and yelled for my mother to stop. She ignored them, and with a furious shout directed her hands at me. Black vines shot out from her palms as a spell of permanent binding slipped from her lips. I was no longer a defenseless little girl. I threw my arm up with a shield to block her attack. The vines crashed into it and spread out, searching for a way to get to me. The violet shield held and I pushed against it, forcing my mother's magic to turn back on her. She grimaced from the effort. Her hands took on a dark, violet glow, and then she was shoving me backward. I might been able to use my magic now, but she had years of practice on me. The shield faltered, and as those black vines soared through the air to entangle me, I crossed my arms in front of my face and yelled as magic exploded from my core. I hadn't thought of a spell, but something stopped those vines from reaching me. My mother screamed and the elders yelled. Violet light blinded me. I was knocked off my feet, and went somersaulting across the chamber floor. I grunted when my back slammed into the wall, and I smacked my head. The storm I'd created out of my raging emotions vanished. I opened my eyes and frowned. Ouch, I grumbled, rubbing the back of my head. Marie? The chamber was filled with fog. I called out again, and my words bounced back to me. Everything in the room was a strange gray scale. There was no color. No light either. Wincing in pain, I stood and walked toward the center of the room. Hello? Can anyone hear me? There was no answer. I strained to remember what happened right before I hit the wall. My mother had attacked me, and I'd reacted with some sort of spell. What the hell was it? Our magic must have collided and knocked me somewhere. Heart pounding as panic set in, I sprinted from the chamber and raced through the house. I shouted, but no one answered me. When I reached the front doors, I shoved them open and stumbled down the front steps to the lawns. There was no color out here either. No witches. No birdsong or stars in the sky. Just me and an endless world of fog. Oh hell Beckett, what did you get yourself into now? I muttered. I was utterly alone, with no idea where I was or how to get back home. Was I even still alive? I gulped and hugged myself as I slowly made my way back to the front porch. There had to be a way out of this mess. Finnick needed me. I was not going to become some forgotten witch in a strange realm just when I finally found my magic and a guy that I first loved, who I was pretty sure loved me back if he'd stop being a dumbass and admit it. You'll get out of this, I told myself. You will. I pictured Finnick in his ever-changing green eyes, steeled my nerves, and walked inside. Chapter 12 Finnick I was late. Too late. Marie, one of the elders, stood close by, explaining to me what happened in the last couple of hours. Beckett had come to speak with the elders about her magic. She'd called Harriet out for her crimes, and there'd been a fight. In the midst of the chaos, Harriet had tried to cast another binding spell, and Beckett's magic reacted for her. Somehow, it knocked her mind into some alternate reality. Just her mind. I held Beckett's cold hand and shook my head. She has no pulse. She's not even breathing. 
She is breathing. It's just every few minutes, Marie assured me. She's alive, Finnick. We'll get her back. How? I asked, the word coming out strangled. I'd rushed over to Beckett's place to find Frankie waiting for me, in tarantula form. After some persuading, he gave in and told me Beckett was most likely headed to the coven house. I'd rushed over there as fast as I could and banged on the front gates until I was finally let in. The moment I explained to the witch in the foyer who I was, his face had paled, and he'd asked me to follow him. He brought me to a room, and my heart had nearly fallen out of my chest. Beckett was lying on a bed, still and cold as death. I'd been standing here staring at her for the better part of an hour, waiting for her to open her eyes. Harriet had attacked her own daughter. She was currently under house arrest, but that wasn't good enough. I don't know yet, Marie finally replied. But we'll find a way. No, I will. Finnick, with all due respect, you just told me you lost your power. There is nothing you can do for her. Watch me, I growled, kneeling by Beckett's side. You listen to me, woman. You're coming back to me. I know I messed up big time, but I'm sorry. I'm not letting you get away from me this easily. Come back to me. Scream at me, curse me out, throw things at me, but come back to me, Beckett. I'm begging you. I pressed my lips to her forehead and prayed with everything I had that she would hear me. One way or another, power or no power, I would get Beckett's mind home. Vengeance against Dion would have to wait just a little bit longer. He was immortal. He wasn't going anywhere. Thank you for listening. This has been a Ciara Graves book. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified of new releases.